Hello and welcome back everyone, we weave online and today I'm gonna continue the series What if Femme Orochimaru was obsessed with Naruto part 6. If you enjoy this video, please give it a big thumbs up and to watch more videos like this, subscribe to my channel and turn that bell notification on so you never miss an upload. Now wasting no more time, let's begin. Jiria walked with a steady pace. Even the destruction around him didn't get much of his attention. Stone walls that have been built on by glaciers. Fires as hot as the sun danced around. But they never got the trees they were near to really catch on fire. Even some steel weapons were lying around. It wasn't good. Or, to be more exact, there was a war. A battle between one boy and himself. When Naruto first suggested this way of training, Jiria thought he was just talking about life in general. How else can you understand the question can you beat a better version of yourself? He didn't think about it again until he saw his godson fight a sage mode shadow clone. He lost it and told the boy how careless, stupid, and rude he was. Sage mode was his ace in the hole for a reason. Even a flawed version gave him such a huge boost in skills, awareness, stamina, and toughness that what Naruto was trying to do was suicidal. Can you beat a better version of yourself? Was the only thing he said. And the Toad Sage wondered if the boy had been hit too much or had gone completely crazy. Until the Sanin really thought about the problem. At that time, Naruto was getting a lot smarter and stronger. His body was getting older. And the way he used his chakras was getting better and wider. Jiraiya didn't think he'd find too many people who could beat the Uzumaki Jinchuriki just by being stronger. But strength isn't all that matters. If you depend on it too much, you won't know what to do when it doesn't work or isn't enough. Naruto couldn't just rely on his advantages when he fought a version of himself who was clearly better. He had to think outside the box, be sneaky, and throw people off. He had to use ninja skills to fight. Jiraiya was surprised by how much thought went into that. He knew his godson wasn't stupid, far from it but he often didn't notice how much Haruzen was like red-haired container. He also would never say the comparison out loud. No matter how much he had changed, Naruto was still in Yuzumaki, and those people were dangerous. Naruto said between breaths, I almost had him, pervy sage. Jiria rolled his eyes as he picked up and put over his shoulder his godson. Yes, you did. But what happens if you actually beat the clone? Cry. Because I won't be able to take over any more land. Jiraiya said, yes, it's pretty clear. Let's see how smart that mouth is when Shizun sees you. What? You're taking me home. I don't need to go to the hospital. Don't be a dick. I could just take you home but it'd cost you. Are you trying to force me to do something? Naruto asked in shock. As Jiraiya walked through the training grounds, he laughed. Yes, whatever power you have will be gone in about 20 minutes, Naruto said. He would get better quickly because the clone hadn't hurt him that much. Jiraiya's only danger was what Shizune and Sato-san would do when Naruto brought him to the hospital. He could take that, though, and then kick Jiraiya's behind later. He could just heal at this point, but Kirama told him not to bother him with small talk from his idiot container. You're right, but there's one thing you haven't thought of. Everyone will think I did this to you. Almost no one knows that's funny, so they'll just laugh it off. If I tell Shizune you did this to yourself, she'll throw a fit and won't let you leave for the rest of the day. I can teleport like crazy. No, don't worry about your surrogate sister. That's your weakness, kid, and I'm using it to my advantage. I hope the kick in the behind you'll get for this later, Titebeo, is worth it. Now, now, no need for harsh words. I just told Tsunade that Orochi and you would join us for dinner, and of course she couldn't miss seeing the two lovebirds in the wild. Are you trying to scam me out of a double date? Naruto asked in even more shock. Hey heh, no matter what. Fine, I'll ask Orochi-chan. But you better be glad you're not a shit godfather or sensei. If you hadn't really trained me, I'd let your ass twist in the wind. Naruto went to Orochimaru's house an hour later. He wanted to give himself enough time to convince her if he needed to. With just two short knocks, his girlfriend in a red robe opened the door. She led the Yuzumaki to her kitchen, where she was having tea and a quiet morning, without saying a word. Kabuto was already at the hospital, so she could enjoy her alone time. She didn't mind seeing Maelstrom, though. Naruto sat down while Orochimaru went and got another cup. Naruto-kun, what are you doing here so early? Oh, I'd love to say that love was the only thing that led me, but I'm here to ask for a favor. Can I ask you a favor? Orochimaru asked as he filled the cup with tea. Yes, I asked for favor because you might be inclined to say no, but I hope that the fact that I owe you something will sway you to join my cause. I'm definitely interested, she said, putting the cup down and swaying seductively. When she got to his seat, she straddled him and looked into his yellow eyes. And if you do me this favor, I can ask you for anything I want in return. 
He nodded, which made her smile, and she started to grind into him gently. She probably already did what he was going to ask, but the timing was great. They had been dating for a little over a month, so this next step might seem a little quick to some, but it was always going to happen. The fact that he wouldn't be able to say no made it even better. Naruto was so caught up in the feeling that he forgot for a moment why he was there. He got over the short-term loss of his executive function, but when she nibbled on his ear, it almost happened again. He decided to stay on task and not do what he really wanted to do and what looked like it could be done on her kitchen table. Jiriya wants us to have dinner with him tonight, so Tsunade Obachin will. Hyukuku, is that it? She asked, grinding her teeth faster. You also need to be nice. Huh, so that's the real favor. Naruto laughed and said, yay. Orochimaru stepped back and looked at Naruto straight in the eyes. Fine, I'll go to dinner and be halfway nice to that miserable slug. And since I've agreed, you wouldn't mind if I cashed in right now, would you? Naruto said, no, and he was proud that his voice hadn't shook. He felt her pull his hand off of her thigh where it had been resting. She put her hand in his and smiled evilly as she did so. Naruto watched as a small white snake wrapped itself around his wrist. He looked into her eyes, and it was clear that he was confused. Her smile just got bigger. Manda wants to talk to you was the last thing he heard before he felt the pull of a being calling him. When the smoke cleared, Naruto was half upright and dumbfounded, and a purple people eater was staring at him. Naruto thought, oh, she's going to have it so hard when I get back. He was determined to really put her bed frame to the test. When Naruto saw that the big snake wasn't going to say anything, he decided he had to start things. Sup? Kekashi didn't move at all as he stood in front of the memorial stone. He had a lot of time to himself because it was still early and his team had gone on an escort mission. Some people thought he came to this stone to think about his past or even beat himself up to get rid of his survivor's guilt. For a while, that's why he spent so much time in front of the memorial to the dead. But not now and not for a long time. Kakashi knew that when the Sanin left, he was the best ninja in Konoha. He did not brag about it, though. He thought it was strangely right, but not in a good way. After Minato Sensei died, Kakashi had lost his way, just like the rest of the village. He got caught up in duty, but he didn't do what he should have done for what was left of his sensei's legacy. When he finally got himself together, the Sandame told him he couldn't be a part of Naruto's life. So he stood back and watched, doing what little he could while keeping quiet. He saw how the young boy grew and changed, and he was prouder than he had ever been. He saw him keep going even though he was hated and alone, because he had a goal in mind. When Kakashi called up Pakan in front of a seven-year-old Naruto, he did so slowly while calling out the hand signs. He did this because he wanted the boy to try. He thought that Naruto would help the toads and that they would take care of him. Even though it wasn't the best plan, it did work, and Naruto was able to find some happiness because he was linked to the Panthers. Kakashi would often think about Konoha as a symbol, a place, and a people as he read the names of the dead. Danzo had a thing for the place. He didn't care much about the people there and he didn't believe in the will of fire. The Sandame had a thing for the people and didn't mind their flaws while they praised them. He was sure that Minato-sensei had given up everything for the three of them. Kakashi wasn't sure if he had the same feelings. He had seen how these people were rude to his sensei, even though they had the nerve to praise him. It was frustrating. Kakashi-kun, deep in thoughts, asked an old voice from behind. About what you'd expect, Sandame sama Find out any big truths. I try, but they keep getting away from me. I understand, ma boy. Change is the only constant, but even the nature of change is always changing. Just three years ago, if I asked for a ninja's attention, I got it without question. Now, they can choose to ignore me or come when they want. It's a bit hard to get used to. As he said this, Haruzen walked over to Kakashi and stood right next to him. I have been very busy, Sandame Sama. Yes, I see, said the former Hakage in a dry tone. I don't blame you for not wanting to be around me. I strained our relationship, or more accurately, your trust in me. I regret it, Kakashi. I regret a lot of things, and I fear I will never be able to make things right. You owe me nothing, Sandame Sama, Kakashi said. Even though it wasn't true, the Haddock didn't want to join the man on his sorry tour. He used his power badly, and there was nothing more to say about it. At the very least, I owe you an apology. I'm sorry for a lot of things, but keeping you away from Naruto was a mistake. I see that now more than ever. All thought Kakashi. It led back to Orochimaru every time. By keeping you and other people away from Naruto, I made him vulnerable to Orochimaru's schemes. She's offered him support, acknowledgement, family, and even a chance at love, 
and of course, he wouldn't refuse any of it. She might be telling the truth, Kakashi said. I don't think so. She might have a fully grown sharing an implant and be hiding it under an advanced contact lens. Who's to say she won't try to free the Kyuubi from Naruto or control him in some way? Only one story and one report say that a single Uchiha was in charge of the Kyuubi. Yes, Madara. The man who is said to have killed Minato and Kushina is likely dead and has been for three years. Orochimaru would have gotten the sharing in from that man. Why are you telling me this now? Does Tsunade-sama know? Because I had another plan. But I'm thinking about giving it up. It's likely she already knows about it, since I've been five steps behind her since before she came back. I'm worried about Naruto's safety and didn't think Jiraiya would let him date her. As far as I know, Jiraiya-sama doesn't let Naruto do anything. It's too bad, but it looks like you're right. This is why I need you, Kakashi. You're not completely uninterested, but you're far enough away to see things from a different point of view. From my point of view, you shouldn't do anything about it. Naruto can take care of himself, and if he can't, he has us. Why do you all think that if she's planning something, you'll have time to react, or that Naruto will be whole so you can save him? He knew his former grandson was strong because he had seen him train Tsunade. But Orochimaru was different, and you couldn't forget about him. Have you tried skipping the games and just talking straight to Naruto? He might tell you to stuff it, but he's not a spoiled brat, so he won't let his feelings get in the way of good advice. If that doesn't work and you're sure she's a threat to Naruto and the village, then flip a coin and kill one of them. No, Kakashi, that's not funny. I'm not joking. If you really think she's a threat and you have no other reason to get rid of her, do it. Sometimes the most heroic thing you can do will look like the worst thing you could do. Remember when you told me that? I do. Because the village came first. Even my loyalty to Minato-sensei wasn't a reason to put it in danger or risk a fight with Kumo or Iwa. It was for the village. Just know that no matter what you decide, I'll be on Naruto's side. I've been manipulated by you enough in my life. Yanni, Kakashi said before disappearing with a shunshin. So the guy says, Lady, that's not a soap dispenser, Naruto said, and Manda laughed. The two were breaking the ice. Naruto was glad the snake wasn't as openly hostile as the stories made it sound. Even though Gamabunta thought he was a savage, he respected his power. Okay, boy, I'm sure you know why you're here. Seeing if Orochi-chan thinks I'm good enough. Yes, I won't let another person get hurt like Haruzen did. Just to save face, he threw her away like a used prostitute. Naruto, I need to know what your plans are. Naruto blushed and felt embarrassed by the question. He knew what he wanted to do and had a plan, but telling her giant snake daddy felt weird, uncool, and awkward. But he couldn't let his reluctance be taken as a lie, so he answered. Manda-sama, I care about her. I don't know what the future holds, but I'd like to have her in my life no matter what. She's sweet, I was like, ugh, that's so stupid, and I only want the best for her. All right, kid. Hey, didn't Baghira teach you to keep your feelings in check? Asked the snake boss. Naruto was annoyed and wondered if he was just being trolled. I won't eat you today, but I'll keep an eye on you. You'll have to deal with me if you start to look like that old monkey. Believe it or not, I am nothing like the old man. We'll find out. But as of right now, you have my permission to properly court Orochi-chan. But if you ever have kids, they can't be toad summoners. They have to be snake summoners. Why? Okay. What about the tigers and lions? Granny Bast made a deal with the Yuzumaki clan. That's fine, just keep that cutthroat pussycat away from me, Manda said. Naruto nodded and felt the same little snake wrap around his wrist, taking him back to Orochi's kitchen. She was at her counter getting ready to chop something, making a late breakfast. Naruto walked up to her, and even though she knew he was there, she never turned around or acknowledged his return. Not even when she felt his arms around her waist. He said in a whisper that wasn't very nice, Titebeo. She said, I've never said I was nice, Naruto-kun, and kept working on getting ready even as she felt his hands slide into her robe. You can, though. Sweet even. Don't worry, I'll keep your secret safe, Naruto spoke up. MHM, Orochi moaned, as one of Naruto's hands went north and the other, slowly, went south good. If these people think they don't need to be afraid of me, they might try to talk to me, Naruto laughed. But he didn't say anything else because joking wasn't on his mind. Orochi agreed, since he was still interested from before. Orochimaru was happy on the inside as she felt her former student getting ready to take her from behind. Just a few weeks ago, he wouldn't have done this. He was shy or uncomfortable with sex, more overly respectful. She didn't know why. Maybe it was her history with Haruzen or Naruto not wanting her to feel used, but she had to get rid of it. One of the things she loved about him was his passion, and she wouldn't settle for anything less. He learned quickly, which was good for both of them. And as she let out a small gasp when Naruto entered, she was happy. Nanda had accepted Naruto, so she wouldn't have to worry about that anymore. 
Maybe Manda would start acting normally again. Orochi frowned when she felt Naruto pull away. But she didn't have time to say how unhappy she was before she was turned around and lifted into the air. She got used to the change in position quickly and deeply kissed Naruto as she rolled her hips. She said, maybe you should make a clone so we can finish this upstairs. And Naruto did as she asked. She laughed at the clone's annoyed face. The clone's silent protest of having to cook while the original was so obvious that he might as well have shouted it. She blew the clone a kiss and winked as she was carried away. She wouldn't know right away, but it was possible that another step of her plan. Just like she said, the hours seemed to go by in the blink of an eye. Now, as her head rests on his chest, gently rising and falling with each breath, she takes a moment to look at him. He'd changed so much in the time they'd been apart, losing much of the roundness in his face but keeping its softness. She also noticed that he seemed to be mentally somewhere else. His look wasn't one of worry but of preoccupation. As if he knew he was being. He said, sorry, I was thinking. I hope I haven't already bored you, Naruto-kun. His answer was, never. So, what did you think about? She inquired. Naruto stopped himself from wanting to lie and say nothing. It didn't feel right, and he didn't want to hide anything. But he also didn't want to worry her, so he changed the subject. Have you thought about starting on a different sub -ailment? It didn't take a genius to figure out what he was trying to do. But she was willing to let it slide for now. In general, yes, the magnet release isn't easy, but it's more than ready for battle for how I plan to use it, she said. Do you have any ideas? She asked, and Naruto nodded. If you're good at Jitten, cotton might be an easier step because it's kind of like the next step, as opposed to a completely different combination of two elements. She was surprised that Naruto thought adding a third element to a manipulation would make it easier, but she knew that he would have the experience. Where do I start? Naruto laughed when he heard her voice and could tell she was excited. He wouldn't be angry at her. He had spent most of his life pushing his chakra to do as much as it could and finding comfort in the joy of a new development. And every new thing that happened just made him want to do even more. Do you have any iron sand on you? The Uzumaki asked as a glowing seal appeared on her left arm and a clump of iron sand appeared on her palm. Start slowly spinning it, he was told. So that's what the snake Sanin did. When she saw Naruto's hands filled with golden chakra, her eyes grew a little wider. She put chakra into the contact lens on her sharing an eye because she wanted to remember everything about this. When Naruto put his hand under hers, she felt it get warm because he was giving her this strong, pure chakra. The iron sand started to stick together and turn into a lump of steel. Now you have to think of an object. The manipulation will be easier if you are familiar with the object, Naruto said. Orochimaru thought about what she would like and quickly made up her mind. Right away, she saw the thing above her hand start to get longer. In almost no time what was once sand was now a handleless Tao sword, the blade a little wider than a katana and the curve more gentle. But she also felt the change from jitten to cotton, even though Naruto said it was complicated. But it also felt like the shape manipulation was easier once I knew how to do it. It's almost like Earth could be something else if it wanted to. She thought about the conversation, but her big brain was more interested in why Naruto would suggest cotton than in how to do what she had just done. She had different ways of thinking, and some people might call her a high-functioning sociopath. She didn't understand her feelings the way most people did, but she forced herself to do so. She knew he was worried because of the way he looked away, changed the subject, and now brought up the cotton. That didn't make sense to me, Naruto-kun. Yes, it's not easy, but I did it, and I'm neither a genius nor the strongest member of a famous trio. She said, you're nice, but I don't think I'd have enough time to learn cotton, and definitely not enough time to learn the impervious armor jutsu you want to teach me. She didn't notice the surprise on his face as she put the sword she had just made on her dresser. She didn't talk again until she got back. Don't worry about I. The lightning armor is strong, but every jutsu has a weak spot. However, covering myself in highly conductive material seems like a bad idea. The lightning armor trades the conductive and piercing power of Raiden for increased strength, speed and near-perfect protection of the user's body. Unless one wielding it intentionally tries, it won't really shock nor pierce you. If that weren't the case, the lightning could be forced to divert to various conductive sources making the user lose control. There's only one way you could know that much about the lightning armor unless you and I get along better than I thought. That's why Tsunade has been so smug about you teaching her something special. Does your girlfriend not deserve such a great jutsu, Naruto-kun? Orochi asked with a pout. I thought you were competing with me. I'm naked right now, so I'm not that right now. And if you always walk around like that, I guess we'll never be competitors. Orochimaru mock horrified her by putting one hand on her chest and the other on her forehead. Think of the scandal, Naruto-kun. 
What about my honor? He couldn't help but laugh at his girlfriend's actions, which made him laugh. After he calmed down, he did make one small change. I'm not teaching Oba-chan how to use the lightning armor, I'm teaching her how to beat it. There is a derivative jutsu called lightning style, overdrive that is weaker but more flexible, and I did show it to her. Well, I guess that's fine, Orochi said, since she knew about that jutsu. In Tsunade's hands, it would be very dangerous, and the snake Sanon was looking forward to their next fight. Orochimaru slid over Naruto and sat on him with the grace that came with her years of experience. She looked into his eyes and repeated what she had said before, Don't worry about my safety. I'm ready to fight the rakage. Naruto started to say, I believe you, but he stopped and took a moment to think. I don't fear I, but I don't understand him either. What does he want? Why does he do this now? Rasa can't have sent him, can she? No, she told him, at most, you'd be an excuse. It also doesn't surprise me that you don't understand him. I have a theory, and if I'm right, it's not a conclusion you'd come to, it's just not you. You mean what? When you look at the state of the Shinobi villages, you see peace. It's not perfect, but it's peace all the same. And you can't understand why anyone would want to change that or sacrifice lives for a decent status quo. But that's the way someone who believes in the will of fire thinks, which is the very idea that led to the creation of Kanoha. Hashirama-sama and Madara made Kanoha to stop the senseless deaths and the sending of. Even if some people are okay with it now, they had to change because Kanoha was there. Since then, every time there was an attempt to change things drastically, like a shinobi war, Kanoha was there to protect the order it needed. Naruto said, it's not worth it. Perhaps, perhaps not, but has getting to know him changed anything? Really not. Orochimaru told Naruto-kun, don't be a hero. If war does come, don't be a fool and be kind to your enemies. Maybe they aren't at fault and are just loyal to a Cretan, but that's their problem. You have responsibilities to your clan, to your friends, and to me to come home in one piece. Don't let Jury's silly ideology shorten your life. Kuma won't care, won't be moved by your sacrifice. Fight with your full power. Promise me, she she knew what she was doing when she made him make this promise, but she also knew he would be selfish and put himself first. The world of Shinobi might have needed a hero, but it would have to look for someone else. She owned him. No one else's but hers. There are times for mercy, Orochi-chan. There are things worth sacrificing yourself for, my clan, my friends, and you. I can't promise to never do that, but I do promise to always try my best to come home. I won't pursue a fool's peace, and if the worst happens and Kumo calls for war, I'll give them all they can handle and then some, Titebeo. She said, that'll do for now, and he gave her a huge smile. I have one more question, that golden chakra was that. Yeah, they're the Kyuubai. We're totally friends now. Oh, so that's why it's not so bad. Naruto said, yes, and I'd love to explain how, but Oba-chan is here, so I need to go get ready. Then he heard a distinct knock. As he grabbed his clothes, he gave her a quick kiss and teleported to his room. Nice ass, Yuzumaki, a person who didn't belong there said. Naruto turned around and his hands went to his private parts. What the heck, Karin-chan? Why are you in my room, Titebeo? Some guy brought Juri Asama in your suits. I was hanging them up because I'm a great cousin. I wasn't expecting a show, and you still don't have one. Then you'll need bigger hands, he said. Naruto's face began to look like his hair. Get out, Databeo. Fine, jeez, said Karin as she left, and Naruto ran into his private bathroom to complain that his father probably never had to deal with things like this. Most of the time, the double date went well. Orochi was nice to Jureya, just like she said she would be. The problem was that the other customers weren't used to seeing the snake Sanin in something as slinky as a black cocktail dress. But when she said, if you want to keep your eyes off of me, don't look at me, that changed. And Juria was also polite when he met her halfway. Even when Orochi talked about Naruto meeting Manda, he didn't completely fall apart. Tsunade and Juria had a wonderful evening with lots of good company, food, and alcohol. As soon as the four of them left the Platinum Lotus, one of Kanoha's best restaurants, Naruto walked Orochi home, and Juriya did the same for Tsunade. Most of the time, the two Sanin had been quiet, and their walk had been lit by the stars. It wasn't a tense silence, but it wasn't a friendly one either. There was still a lot between them that they hadn't talked about, and since they had more life behind them than in front of them, they both wondered if that would ever change. Tsunade tugged at Juriya's black suit jacket. The piece of clothing on her shoulders helped her stay warm in the cool night air. I know you got Naruto to come along, so if you asked me, I would say yes to this. Juria smiled and said, I didn't have any doubts, but I still think it was worth it. It was a lot of fun, and I could use more of that. Juria said, heavy is the head, but didn't finish the quote. Tsunade nodded. 
I knew it would be. But Sensei couldn't keep going and you wouldn't have taken the chair, so that left me in a position I never wanted. Living someone else's dream. Sometimes that's all we can do for the dead. I wonder what Minato would say and whether he'd forgive me if I'd changed over the last three years. Tsunade said, You really did love him like a son. Yes, I did. I never understood how you could leave, how we all seemed to be so much less important. It wasn't until Minato that I really understood how hopeless it was to see your future taken away. It wasn't that you didn't care about us, you just couldn't see a way forward, and I'm sorry I couldn't help you. I am, too, Jureya. I knew how you felt, and I should have reached out. Who knows how things could have turned out differently. They didn't say anything else until they got to Tsunade's door. Jureya said, tonight was fun, we should do it again sometime. Sure, I wouldn't mind, Tsunade said, and she gave her old teammate his suit jacket. They said goodnight, and Jiria went home feeling more hopeful than he had in a long time about some parts of his life. Orochimaru wore a suit jacket around her shoulders, just like Tsunade. The charcoal gray sharkskin jacket that Naruto gave her fit a little better than Jiria's jacket did on Tsunade. As they got closer to Orochi's house, they moved closer together. There were more and more accidental touches of the arm or hand. When Naruto put his arm around the Sanin's waist and stole a kiss from him under the streetlight, the accident turned into a plan. She asked, are you staying tonight? You aren't sick of me yet, are you? He asked in a cheeky way. I'm just as shocked as you are, said Orochi. He gave her another kiss because he knew she had already kissed him. It was supposed to be short, but it turned into something else. They didn't want to waste time, so they ran to Orochi's. Naruto kissed her again as she stood with her back to the door. On his own, he whispered, someone's here. She agreed, since she could also feel someone's presence and had a good idea who it might be. Naruto left without saying anything and Orochi straightened up before going inside. As she ran to where her intruder was, she saw her sensei sitting in a chair with Kabuto, who had been beaten and was being held back, next to him. She didn't try to play a game when she asked, Why are you here? Before I answer, why doesn't Naruto drop the Jinjutsu and join us? There won't be any need for an assassin's strike in the dark. Suddenly, several shimmers appeared, and it was clear that Naruto had sneaked in three shadow clones along with himself. Hum, I only saw two shadow copies. I must be getting old. You can think about how bad things have gotten for you somewhere else. What do you want? To stop this war between us, or Ichimaru? To reach some kind of truce before things get so bad that you can only try to kill me or I can only try to kill you. This surprised the snake Sanin, who thought her sensei would never stop trying to catch her. But he was right, there weren't many more places they could go before they had to try to kill each other. After he had brought her down and made her feel bad, she wanted him to die. It would be a good way to end their story. No, not for the event. She wouldn't say she didn't like the man and respect him as a ninja, but compared to Naruto, Haruzen was just something to do to pass the time. She also didn't care about the abortion. Having a child wasn't in her career plans at the time, and she'd seen his other kids and they weren't very impressive. No, the reason she hated Haruzen Sarutobai so much was because he made up a story about a student who used her charms to get chosen as the next Hokage so he could keep his marriage. This made sure that he would never, for any reason, let her take his place. He killed her dream so he wouldn't have to face the consequences of what he did. She often thought, with bitterness, that was the best time Haruzen had ever fucked her. So, she hurt his loved ones, spat on his will of fire, and forced him to eat because she was his favorite student. But she no longer needed that. She had won. He had left in scandal and shame, and more importantly, she had Naruto, which could be in danger if she kept trying to beat her sensei. She needed things to stay stable in the village for the time being, no matter what was going on outside. She had won. It was a win in every way. She chose to sit down and give the man a chance to talk. As Haruzen started to explain why Kabuto was hit, neither the Sandame nor the Orochimaru paid much attention to Naruto. He didn't say anything, but they couldn't hear the most important conversation in the room because he was being quiet. The old man lies. I can tell he is lying as if it were a tenth tale, Naruto. Thanks, Kurama. If he hurts her, I'll lose Konohamaru and maybe even Kurenai-sensei, but I'll get rid of him. The idea doesn't make you happy even now. I never really wanted the old man dead. I just wanted him to do better or get out of the way. And as much as I hate to admit it, I can't forget how he treated me when I was younger. I was so mad at him then that I could have turned into someone you could never respect. That has to count for something. But my gratitude has limits, and he's long past them. What are you going to do? Kirama asked. He couldn't help his friend very much. He knew Naruto was telling the truth and wanted the old monkey to stop getting in the way. I really don't know, she said. 
Naruto asked Jiraiya, do you ever regret what you did? Naruto hadn't slept much since the old man's confession the day before. After Haruzen left, Naruto watched as Kabuto's lover nearly broke his head while beating him. He could feel Kirama's disappointment in Kabuto's actions by subtly channeling her chakra. The wrong in his reason, but her anger hurt her the most. It didn't burn like his anger did. Before he integrated and got a real handle on his emotions, Naruto's anger often felt like it could melt tempered steel. Hers was cold but just as clear in what it said. But he didn't help because she didn't feel out of control, and he was right. The disgraced doctor was told to leave and given a mission that he didn't pay much attention to. But while he was helping Kabuto get up from the ground, he put a Horatian marker on him. Kabuto had shown that he could be a threat, and if that happened, he would die quickly. Jiria looked at his godson, a young man with red hair who was sitting under a tree and looking up at the sky. But his eyes didn't seem to focus. Not for the first time, Jiria was curious about what his last student saw. If there was one big difference between Naruto and Minato, it would be that Minato, for all his intelligence, often only thought about the present and the next problem. His weird and, well, unhuman ability to process things at a speed that would make Anara jealous let him do it. Naruto often seemed to be thinking about the future and treating the present as an afterthought. Their growth showed what they thought about the world. After seeing a tailed beast bomb, Minato made the Rasengan and improved the Horatian. Naruto thought he could use the secondary elements before he really knew how to use the primary ones. Jiria never saw Minato have any doubts about himself. He didn't lack self-reflection, he just made quick decisions and moved on. Naruto worried, thought, and struggled. Minato was the ideal shinobi, but Naruto was the strongest. I have many regrets, kid, but you'll have to be more specific. Seriously training me. You didn't have to make me a toad summoner or ask me to train to be a sage. Some of the sub-elements I learned came from the information you gave me. Juria answered right away, not for a second. From where is this coming? Before answering, Naruto hesitated because he wasn't sure how to say everything. When I first started training seriously, it was because I was angry. There were so many things in my life I couldn't control. I couldn't know about my parents. I couldn't change my reputation. I couldn't not be the shortest. I couldn't not be alone. But my chakra was something I could control, and yet some fucking geek was telling me when I could learn jutsu. I couldn't stand it, so one day I made a decision. And I made that. I didn't know then that strength can't exist in a vacuum, not in this world. I made a choice almost 10 years ago, and I keep making it every day since. I wanted to be the strongest, the best. What would be better about you being weaker? Naruto said, I'd probably sleep better. Bullshit. You may have made the choice at 7, but you would have made it at 10 or 12 or whenever. The weak are preyed on until they get stronger or someone else does it for them. At what point do you just pray for the weak, no matter how good your intentions are? Juriya rubbed his chin and figured out some of Naruto's worries by doing so. He hadn't told Tsunade what Naruto could really do yet, because there wasn't much reason to. Juriya had seen and trained five strong shinobi. Minato could decimate armies. Nagato could do so much more. Naruto was just in a different class, and he was probably by himself. You don't go looking for trouble, Naruto. That's arguable, and I'm at least open to the idea. Kid, you didn't make the first war. We fought a few before you came here. I'm not saying that. But Ross's dossier on me didn't exactly help matters, even if it was just a pretext. Strength invites challenge, whether out of fear, anger, grief, or arrogance. In a world full of killers, what good is being the strongest and best while talking about peace? When your enemies only see your strength, the peace you want looks like tyranny. We don't have to just kill. We can be more than that. I could build every person in Konoha a new house, and they'd think it was cool. If I killed the rakage with a tree root, I'd be made Hokage the next day. We didn't become killers on our own, we had help. Someone was paying the clans, and someone pays for missions now. It's a complicated web that runs on violence, where the client sees one thing and the enemy sees something else. No one is encouraged to see the humanity. Jiraiya said, I think people will understand each other, Naruto, and Naruto shook his head. I think they can too, but understanding doesn't promise anything. What if what we want is just incompatible? Understanding won't change that. Or what if we can't give up that feeling we get when we beat our enemies? That high you get when you put your life on the line, look death in the face, and get away with it. The excitement of real victory. I can't argue against that. But it's better than making false assumptions and shedding blood. Come on, what started this? We talk about people understanding each other, but that doesn't even happen in Konoha. Or maybe it has and that's the problem, said Naruto. He knew he wasn't making himself clear, so he just said what he meant. 
When we got back, the old man was waiting for us at Orochi house. Chance he had made a plan with Kabuto, but he said he was giving up on it and called for a sort of truce between her and him. That is good. He told a lie. Less so. I knew he almost killed her when he didn't help her against Nagato, but I didn't have much of a choice because he was Hakage. He's no longer Hakage. Naruto rubbed his face in irritation. In some ways, they know each other better than anyone else. They enjoy playing these games, and she isn't just a bystander. I understand her role, but my patience has run out. If he moves against her again, I'll get involved. Juria asked, did you think about talking to him? But she already knew the answer. He sometimes forgot that the Kyubai had given him the ability to sense negative emotions. He sees me as a seven-year-old prop, not as an agent with my own will. I don't want to do this, Juria. I'm more than happy to leave him alone. Then make him see you differently. I've tried to dissuade him, and I'm sure Tsunade has as well. But Sensei is sure he's protecting you. Maybe he just needs to be reassured that's not the case. Besides, even if you were right to move against him, you have to know that there are a lot of ninja who would stand in your way. Retired Hokages live in a murky. He doesn't have enough people between us to scare me away. Jiriya thought, ah, so that's part of the problem. Don't feel bad about things you haven't even done yet, you idiot. Your mother would kick your ass if she saw you pouting like this, and then she'd feed you an inhuman amount of ramen, Juria said with a laugh. Naruto also laughed because he liked the idea. I think you should go talk to him. Believe it or not, he really does think he's doing this for you. But enough of that, what are we working on today? A few clones will try out Steel Release, but I'll be training Yin Yang Release. Why don't I just save you some time and take you to the hospital now? Naruto said, it's not that bad, Titebeo, but in reality, it was. This was by far the hardest release he's tried, since Naruto couldn't make a single jutsu or reliably channel chakra into nature. Whatever, kid. What are you trying to do? I've got time, so when you knock yourself out, I'll get you where you need to go. Naruto rolled his eyes but got to work, determined to make his godfather eat his words. So, what are you trying to do exactly? I might be able to help. I've been learning how to make healing chakra from Oba-chan. Her ability to heal herself comes mostly from her mastery of yin release. She thought that Hashirama ability Sama's to heal himself came from his mastery of yang release, Naruto said. Which makes sense given what the Mokutan wants, Juria said. Yes, I'm trying to use yin yang release. If I can, I think it will let me heal even more deeply than Hashirama Sama without any of Oba downsides, chans and I could use it on other people as well as myself. How extreme? It's hard to say. But the yin-yang release is basically pure creation, so who knows? Naruto replied. Juria's eyes light up when he thinks about what this technique could do. If Naruto could do it, it would be a big step forward in medicine. Juria shouted, what are you waiting for? Do it. This broke Naruto's concentration. I'm trying, you dirty pig. Try harder. Naruto's hair turning into nine separate tails was the only warning Juria got before the chase began with one toad sage pursuing the other with determination. Tsunade had a grim look on her face in another place. Orochimaru told everyone about Haruzen's confession and his plea for peace. Neither of the women thought the man was finished. Tsunade knew that neither side would ever really change, because they had both grown to dislike each other over the years. Is Kabuto still alive? Of course, Kyukyuko, Tsunade hummed in response. Even though the boy said he told Sasori where to find Naruto, it wasn't certain that she would have left him alive. Tsunade wouldn't have cared if Orochimaru killed him, but if he did it without going through the right channels, it could have caused trouble, which was what the Sandame wanted. It wasn't a terrible idea. Where is he right now? Orochimaru said. He was told to join Kimimaro-kun and the others in their search for Zetsu. Tsunade gave her friend a quick glance. Are you sure that was a good idea? The Kaguya seems to be very loyal. But what will happen if he guts Kabuto? Kimimaro won't do any lasting harm because he knows how to do what he's told. Uh huh, and what if they find Zetsu and defeat him? Orochimaru said, in a sarcastic tone, I don't know why, Tsunade-chan. You're the Hokage, so I'm sure you'll figure it out. Tsunade just rolled her eyes and then let out a sigh. Now that Naruto knows about the secret room, are you finally going to tell him? Yes, tonight, Orochimaru said, her voice no longer sounding like she was having fun. If he doesn't reply well, Orochimaru said, I'll take care of it, Tsunade-chan. Tsunade nodded, and that was the end of it. The snake summoner decided to change the subject because he didn't like how tense things were. We've been so focused on how my night went that we haven't even talked about what you did after dinner, she said with a sly grin. Tsunade-chan, did you let that toad play in your well? 
What? Sunade asked in real surprise. It's a figure of speech. The toad is Juria, and the well is your vag, she started to say, but was cut off before she could finish. I know what you meant, and no, of course I didn't do it. What's wrong with you? I'm a well-adjusted sociopath who got cock-blocked by an old man. It was a rhetorical question, and I replied with a speech. Ugh, if you keep doing this, I'll report you as a missing ninja, Sunade said in a faked-out frustration. If the teacher's sexual habits were that bad, I'm glad the student doesn't copy them. Once again, all Juria did was walk me home. It's ridiculous to even suggest that he did anything else. Yes, you did go out with him. That was so I could watch you in Naruto. You don't go out much, so how else could I see you blush cutely when Naruto does something sweet? Orochimaru tried to upset Tsunade once more by saying, I had no idea you liked to watch. I have fun wherever I can, Tsunade said, refusing to give her friend any more power. But, let's be serious for a second, wouldn't it bother you if Jiraiya and I were dating? I thought you hated him. I used to hate Jiraiya when we were kids, but then I realized he was just trying to get Sensei's attention like the rest of us. Once you realize that, he's just a sad little fool that's fun to make fun of. Plus, even I know how important it is to have someone on your side, and we fought a war together. Don't stay away because of me. Naruto was making his way to the Hyuga compound at a steady pace. Jiraiya had teased him, but he hadn't made himself unconscious or used up all of his chakra network in his attempt to release Yin and Yang. Even though it wasn't a huge step forward, and a shockingly small number of people could even use the release, Naruto thought he was getting the hang of how it felt to call on the two different energies at the same time in almost perfect balance. The leader of the Uzumaki was happy with his progress, but he wouldn't show it on his face. He couldn't explain it, but he could tell Kirama was worried about something. He didn't know much about Kirama's personality, but the fox was never afraid to say what he thought. This made Naruto both interested and worried. Kirama, are you okay? He asked, why? I, I am torn, the biju shared. How can I help? No, because you are at the center of the conflict. There is a technique that uses yin-yang release, but I have only ever seen two people use it. And neither of them learned it, they just knew how to do it. I bet one of them was your father. Yes, Kirama quickly answered. Naruto didn't respond right away. He knew how much Kirama looked up to his father, so even thinking about giving him a technique would be a big deal. Well, I still have a ways to go with Yin Yang release, so why don't you wait until then to worry about it? Naruto thought, there's no need to stress yourself out for no reason. Hirama said, you are closer than you think. He had been with the boy his whole life and probably knew more about his chakra than Naruto himself did. He was very close to being able to use the hardest releases with confidence. It wasn't even a question of when, but of how, and the fact that the boy thought of healing before the potential destructive powers showed what Kirama already knew that his container was a good person. Hirama didn't know if he was the person his father had talked about. He even wondered if such a person could exist, because the Biju thought that this world didn't want such a person to be in the spotlight. But if someone like that did exist, Kirama thought Naruto would be the most likely one. One of his favorite memories is of a 14-year-old boy who told him that he should be his friend because no one should be alone. Hirama thought Naruto wouldn't abuse the power, so he decided to help him learn the highest level of ninjutsu. Now that one of his worries was gone, Kirama cut the link and let Naruto concentrate. Naruto felt Kirama stop talking, and the feeling was hard to explain. He didn't mind that the fox never closed things like a person would. As soon as he was done talking, he just stopped. It was blunt, but what else would you expect from a big fox? Naruto walked to where he usually trained Hanabi outside. He heard about her before he saw her hitting a training post with care. It would take her months to change her instincts away from the gentle fist, but she was a hard worker and a pleasure to teach. He also saw her ninjato sitting next to her, with a little charm tied to the handle. Others might tell her to stop, but Naruto wouldn't. She wasn't a Kanoichi yet, but she was learning to be one as a child. Also, why shouldn't she do it if she was good enough to get away with it? Hayashi and Neji were also there to watch the Uzumaki watch his student. Hayashi was there, which wasn't a surprise because he sometimes showed up at their sessions. Neji, on the other hand, was a surprise. Since Naruto had told the Hyuga about his past, they had run into each other, and the Hyuga didn't seem to know what to think of him. Naruto thought he could stop worrying about other people if he just went to that girl with the bun hair one night and got with her. No one would be surprised if Juria agreed with Naruto's assessment. Hayashi-san, Neji-san, Naruto greeted. Hanabi heard, but she knew to keep warming up and that small talk could wait. Hayashi answered, Naruto-san. Uzumaki-san, Neji said. What do you two plan to do today? Naruto asked with genuine interest. It would be a really bad lesson to learn. 
Hayashi said, if you don't mind, and Neji just nodded. Of course not, and it looks like she's done warming up. Good morning, Hanabi-chan. Good morning, Naruto, she said, and she didn't care that her father's face twitched for a moment. Naruto didn't require or ask her to call him sensei, so she didn't, and her father had to accept it. What are we doing today? I'm not going to have to fight those evil gummy things again, am I? Naruto was happy. Naruto made some of his water style, gummy paladins to fight her so she could practice her new teijutsu style. Hanabi didn't like fighting the little golems because they weren't much stronger than the average water clone, but they were a lot tougher. Not today, Hanabi-chan. We're going to get you used to fighting without one of your best weapons. He waited a moment while she thought about it and then told her, no. My Byakugan, yes, I'm not saying it will happen, but if you need to rely on other senses, it's best to have trained and prepared for it. Now, the rules are simple. Once it starts, I will move no more than five feet from where I am now. You must find me and get this scroll, he said, pulling a red scroll out of his pocket. Once you've done that, we'll move on to the next activity. Do you have any questions? Just one question, how do you plan to stop my Byakugan? Of course with Jinjutsu, he said. Hanabi said, Oh, I don't think you quite understand how my eyes work, Naruto. Naruto just smiled and made a series of hand signs. Before the Hyuga heiress knew what was going on, she was completely covered in darkness. A never-ending darkness that had no beginning or end. What most people don't know about Tabarama Senju's Jinjutsu is how hard it is on the mind to be stuck in pure, never-ending nothingness. If they are not disciplined or have a weak mind, the insecurities that poor people try to hide will come out. Others feel paranoid because their well-trained instincts tell them that danger is everywhere. Hanabi had forgotten who she was, and the illusion made her feel like she didn't belong in this strange night. She jerked at every sound, but she couldn't figure out where it was coming from. She knew she just had to walk straight ahead and then decide if her sensei moved farther back or to the side. But it was hard to take that first step. Her body screamed that moving meant she would die right away. She could only be safe if she didn't move. She could feel her body shivering, and she was filled with fear and dread. Hayashi and Neji watched from outside the illusion, but neither of them could break through it with their famous bloodlines. Hayashi knew about this technique, but he had never seen or wanted to see it. To think that the art they were already good at protecting could beat them. The Nidame was a very scary man, and the fact that Naruto seemed to use the jutsu without much thought made Hayashi think that the boy was stronger than he thought. Uncle, what does this move mean? It's called the Bringer of Darkness, and Tabarama-sama made it. It's an S-class forbidden jutsu. How do you think Yuzumaki knows how to do something like that? I can only guess. Maybe Tsunade-sama showed him, but I doubt she'd let him look at the forbidden scroll. Or maybe Orochimaru knows the technique and taught him. Really, luck is on his side, Neji said. Even though he didn't show it on his face or in his voice, Hayashi could hear that he was angry and jealous. Over the last few years, his nephew had changed a lot. He had stopped hating the main branch, but his Ashi's words did not get through to him. His faith in fate and his belief that he could see how it worked were too important to him. Back in the dream, Hanabi had decided to keep moving forward. Every step felt like a battle won, leaving me both physically and mentally exhausted. So far, she had taken five steps, and one more. Slowly, she forced her body to stop reacting to every sound as if it were a serious threat. Step 7. Next, she used only her willpower to stop her legs from shaking. She took her eighth step into something solid, and she felt a hand on the top of her head. Before she could do anything, the illusion was gone and she could see her sensei's whiskered face smiling down at her. He told Hanabi-chan, You did a great job, but the Hyuga didn't think it was true. Naruto could tell from her face that she knew. You may not think you did anything, but you did. On my first mission outside of the village, we were ambushed by some bandits, and I froze. All my instincts and training left me. Luckily, the Chunin leader took care of them. But if he hadn't, I would have been a liability. I told myself I'd never freeze like that again. But that doesn't mean I wasn't scared. We shouldn't ignore our fears, but we also shouldn't let them stop us from doing what we want to do. You overcame your fears and reached your goal. That's great, so don't belittle it. Hi, she said, a little embarrassed by how sincere Naruto was. She saw that he was still holding the scroll, so she reached out for it. The Uzumaki gave it to her without saying anything. When she opened it, she saw instructions for how to do a sealless replacement jutsu. Hanabi took the scroll and started practicing right away. I want you to slowly start reducing the number of hand signs needed to do the replacement jutsu. I won't lie, most jutsu are too complicated to really be done without hand signs, and trying to do so in the middle of a battle would likely take more time than just doing them. But for this or the shushin, going sealless is not only possible, but it could save your life. Naruto turned around and walked back to Hayashi, 
and Neji. That was very smart, Naruto sensei. A seasoned teacher would tell Hanabi you were testing one thing when you were really testing something else. Well, I've gotten a little practice with Konohamaru and his friends so I'm not entirely new to this. Uzumaki-san, how did you learn the Nidames Jutsu? As a thank you for the friendship between the Senju and the Uzumaki before the hidden villages were built, and between Konoha and Yuzushio afterward. Hashirama-sama and Tabarama-sama left scrolls of some of their jutsu with the Uzumaki. Once my heritage was revealed and I was given my inheritance, all I had to do was find the scrolls. Alliance, Yuzushio, Neji asked, confused. Hayashi told his nephew, yes, the Uzumaki weren't just a clan, they were cousins of the Senju. Hashirama wife, Sama's Maido, was an Uzumaki herself and a skilled Fuinjutsu user. You come from a good family, Uzumaki-san. Naruto gave a shrug. Neji wasn't wrong, and Naruto could see the benefits of being born to his parents, but the fact that they died on the day he was born made some of those benefits go away, or he could have just been crazy. When Kirama spoke again, the three people were still watching Hanabi train. He said, there's going to be a problem. What? Remember that thing we thought might happen. But if it did, it wouldn't happen for years. You mean your yin half is reforming not with you but outside the seal and somewhere near or in Kanoha? Yes, you have a minute. Naruto made a lot of shadow clones. One of them was supposed to find Tsunade and ask her not to send any ninja to the place where the other Kirama showed up. One to Jiraiya to tell him to do the same. Naruto himself spread his chakra around to find out where his father's Horatian markers were. Ten seconds went by quickly, and he still hadn't told Hayashi anything. The man was surprised to see someone make hundreds of something that could kill a Jounin if they tried to make five. Hayashi wouldn't have been able to ask his question because he saw something he hoped he'd never see again. Everyone in Kanoha froze in fear when the thing they hated the most, the thing they thought killed the fourth Hokage, appeared above them. As they looked at the strange fox, it was very quiet, almost spooky. Then, as if a spell had been broken, they all got their senses back at the same time that Naruto's copies started to spread. There was a shared aha moment. When the Kyuubai came back, chaos broke out. For some, the return of the Kyuubai didn't just bring back painful memories that they had long forgotten. No, they thought they were seeing proof that Naruto was dead. Tsunade and Orochimaru would have done something dangerous if they hadn't seen a clone. The clone replied, I'm fine. We thought this could happen, but we thought it would be years before it did. Tsunade asked in a panic, what happened, and how are you still alive? My dad didn't seal the entire Kyuubai into me. Only half. He took the other half with him but someone he was freed from the Shinigami's stomach. Dead people can't be Jinchuriki and without the power of the Shinigami, the Kyuubai's other half was going to always return. We had hoped it would simply return to the one in the seal but as you can see that hasn't happened. Why didn't you warn me? I thought I'd be Hokage by the time it came back, but it's been three years and the Sanbai still hasn't come back. That's no excuse. You should have warned me even if it never happened. I know and I'm sorry. The original will take care of it, but you have to keep the other ninja away. If they attack, the Kyuubai will too. Orochimaru said, I'm going with the original. Before the clone could say anything, she was gone. Tsunade told her ANBU to lock down the whole village. Kekashi moved through the streets, which was hard because of all the chaos. Even though the giant fox hadn't done anything yet, the screams were very loud. A little confused, she looked down at the village. That wasn't important. He knew that a Jinchuriki couldn't live through the Biju being taken out of the seal or leaving the seal in any other way. He swore that he would fail again, but he had to find Naruto. He didn't know why, but he had to look at his body himself. Kakashi heard a voice he had heard before say, You shouldn't be going that way. Naruto, clone but yes, I'm alive and can deal with the fox. You won't get anywhere by going there. Why are you doing this to us? A villager yelled at the clone and more people turned to look at him. Please stop it. We all have families. Please, look, just get to the shelters. This isn't something I'm doing. I'm not attacking the village. But the fox, everything will make sense after the real me takes care of this. I won't let the village get destroyed. The clone saw the doubtful looks, but the ninja on the scene pushed them toward the shelters while they thought about what to believe. Haruzen and Jiria both were hurtling toward the fox, Jiria holding off on summoning Gamabunta in case Naruto needed to do so. But the toad sage couldn't move forward because he saw ninja trying to attack clones of Naruto. Several yelling they had been right, the fox boy had simply bid his time to strike. No one could touch the clones, but they couldn't attack either because they didn't want to prove the crazy shinobi right. Stop your attacks this instance. Jiria bellowed. Jiria sama, he. Shut the hell up. If the fox were out of the seal Naruto's clones wouldn't exist because he'd be dead or dying. How then? 
That's not your job. Help people get to safety and wait for further instructions. And if I ever see you attack my godson again, I'll kill you where you stand. Go. He yelled. Thanks. No problem. Do you know if the original has a plan? Get him out of the village and try to talk things out. What if that doesn't do the trick? Let's hope it does. The clone answered and Jurier returned to chasing toward the Kyubai at top speed. Somehow he managed to make it to the Kyubai's location at the same time as his sensei, who was decked out in battle armor. Each watched as Naruto held out his fist toward the biju. Said Chakra Beast seemed to consider the offer, instead deciding to slam down his hand on top of Naruto. They got pale because they thought the fox had killed him. In another part of the village, Naruto was making his sensei feel better. After she saw the Kyuubai, she put on her shoes and got ready to go look for Naruto. The Sandame had told her that Naruto would die if the Kyuubai ever got out of the seal. She was met at the door by her student, or a clone. He told her quickly what was going on, which didn't make her feel better, but at least she knew he wasn't dead. He took her back to her sofa and stayed there. When they first come into being, most things don't know who they are. Hirama was there, and even though it was different, I wouldn't recommend it. He had come back from hell, where he was stuck with that stupid Hakage. He wasn't the worst person, but cutting the fox in half was a stupid thing to do. Someone broke the promise, and they both got out of the Shinigama's stomach. He thought Minato Bastard had gone to the Pure Land, but he had to wait for him to come back. When he saw it, he felt bad feelings after bad feelings. He almost forgot that he didn't have to go through that. He still hadn't done anything. When he got all of his senses back, it was too much. He remembered that he was sealed in this place after spearing his old containers. And then a red-haired person appeared before him. The boy's hair looked like Kushina's, and he could feel that his other half was inside him. It was strange. He didn't feel any anger or hate in him. Kirama had only met one person who didn't hate anyone. Even Ashura wasn't completely free of it. If you got him drunk and asked him about Indra, you would see it. Kirama had to put him to the test to see if he was pulling a trick. He tried to squash the boy without telling him. Before his hand could leave the ground he heard laughing in his ear. That wasn't very nice, Kirama, he said, really not bothered by the Biju's show of strength. Would you mind going elsewhere so we can talk in private? Kirama nodded and for the second time felt himself being teleported. We're like 10 miles outside of the village. So, what's up? You talk to me so casually. Have you and my other side really become so close? If you'd simply bumped fists with me you'd have the answer to that and a lot of other questions. Instead, you try to squish me. Not cool. Neither is ripping me in half. That's true. Dad could have been a little kinder to you, but I'm not him. So, big guy, what's the plan? Excuse me. Your plan. I can't release your other half without dying so I'm sorry, but reunification will have to wait. And I wouldn't recommend staying in the land of fire but I do know somewhere I can take you. That fake Madara is still out there, though I wouldn't worry too much as he's living on borrowed time. You didn't say that I broke your seal. I didn't. I didn't think you'd want to for any reason I could think of, and I also thought it would make you angry, and I'd rather you stay calm. Kirama smiled and said, that was a good choice. If you channel my chakra, I can connect with my other half. Naruto jumped off Kirama and did what Kirama said, making the full chakra cloak. Orochimaru, Jiraiya, the Sandame, Kakashi and a team of a NBU arriving just as Naruto activated the form. Even people who didn't have senses could feel how strong Naruto's chakra was. Those that were sensors would describe it as endless, as if they'd been dropped into an ocean with no sense of surface nor bottom. The Biju and the container fought with their fists, and in an instant, Kurama got the memories and thoughts of his young half. Once he'd absorbed the information he looked at the Yuzumaki, as if considering him for the first time. Could he be the one his old man had spoken about? Should he help just in case he was? The debate felt moot, his young half's impression so strong. His belief in his friend so sincere the yin half couldn't argue with it. He knew what he would do, but he was going to make the boy work for it. My other half has accepted you and I will as well. But you must earn my cooperation in the same manner you earned his, without his help. I accept. Naruto shouted. He deactivated the cloak and walked over to the gathered ninja, assuming Jiria told them not to attack. Hey, you should all go. Naruto kun we will do no such thing, the Sandame stated, firmly. I don't have time for this. I've already beaten the Kyuubai once and I was weaker then. Besides, this one doesn't want to kill me but it's going to be a massive fight regardless of what we do. Alright, the kids got it handled so let's go back and run damage control. Jiria ordered but no one moved, which annoyed him. Listen, you can't fight the Kyuubai, and you're just going to get in the way. Minato died sealing the Kyuubai, Jiria. The Sandame yelled. Minato isn't Naruto, Jiria responded. We wouldn't help at all. Are you sure you can win? Orochimaru asked Naruto, finally speaking. 
Yes, it's just a spar anyway. No one's life is on the line if you all stay out of it. She accepted his reassurance, not knowing him to be arrogant or to overestimate himself. She also wouldn't deny there was a thrill in seeing her lover best to bid you by himself. I won't leave because I want to see this. Besides, if you win I might do that thing I know you want but are too shy to ask for. Naruto couldn't fight the faint blush that colored his cheeks as he muttered a quiet awesome at the prospect. Once that moment passed he decided to propose a solution. Create a barrier. It'll help contain the damage and you can stay and watch but you have to give us plenty of room. Naruto-kun, the sand dame started to say. Just, for once, trust me. The sand dame didn't have the heart to continue his protest, even if every fiber of his being felt this was a mistake. He simply nodded and got into position. Kakashi put his hand on Naruto's shoulder in silent encouragement before doing the same. As for you, ANBU, I'm not kidding about not being in this barrier. If you get hurt, that's on you, and if I find you, I'll teleport you somewhere you don't want to be. As Naruto said this, a few people realized that the redhead had teleported the Kyuubai and must have known how to use the Horatian. They all wondered if that's why the young man was so confident. Naruto walked away from the onlookers and waited for them to get into position. In under a minute a barrier was erected, one Naruto recognized as the Four Crimson Ray Formation, something Tabarama-sama had left in his Jutsu scroll. He didn't have time to be impressed as Kurama took advantage and quickly charged and fired a chakra blast, one just short of a biju bomb. Naruto simply looked at the fast-moving energy beam and smirked. He continued to wait until he deemed the time right. Horatian no Jutsu version 3 he thought as he activated the technique and swapped places with Kirama. The Yin by having no choice but to absorb his own attack, the powerful blast managing to topple the Great Fox. Naruto was not stationary, on the move as soon as he switched with Kirama. When he was within range he sped through hand signs performing the water style, Great Flood Jutsu. A massive amount of water emerged, all rushing toward a still off-balance Kirama. The fox, annoyed at being subjected to his own attack, lashed out with one of his might tails, splitting the surge of water down the middle. His vision no longer obstructed he watched as Naruto continued chaining hand signs. On instinct the strongest of the biju rolled out of the way, narrowly avoiding a two separate spiked glaciers posed to impale him. Naruto smiled. He expected his ice style, frozen torrent to hit the fox but it appeared his time inactive hadn't left him rusty. Kirama rushed toward Naruto. His every step shook the very earth. Mid-stride, he ran his paw against the ground, overturning rock and uprooting trees as he swung the limb toward his opponent. Naruto ran forward quickly, dodging the broken pieces while making two shadow copies of himself. Once that was done the original activated his lightning style, red lightning armor and closed the distance faster than Kirama anticipated. Naruto delivered a swift kick to the fox's snout. Kirama grimaced upon impact, swatting Naruto out of the air in retaliation. The Uzumaki flew back, impacting the ground with tremendous force, a crater forming as a testament to Kirama's strength. Naruto was fine, the lightning armor able to absorb blunt force, though the rapid change in elevation was disorienting. Not wanting to allow the Uzumaki a chance to attack, the Biju intended to pounce but was impeded by a series of steel chains wrapping themselves around him. He felt the cold steel wrap around his body, tightening with such force it was almost pulled completely to the ground. But he struggled mightily, bracing under the pull of the jutsu. The clone that performed the steel style, bindings of the underworld wasn't done and soon Kirama felt an intense shock. He refused to take his eyes off the original so he missed the red lightning dragons traveling through the steel chains. Enduring the lightning style, ground dragon flash and getting annoyed at being pushed by a whelp, Kirama released a chakra shockwave, stopping Naruto's forward progress. A tail strong enough to level mountains crashed toward the clone, carving a trench into the earth. The clone managed to evade the lethal appendage, replacing himself with a log. The original dropped the lightning cloak as he surveyed the land. For such a short fight, the devastation was just short of awe-inspiring. If they were on Yuzushio he'd drag it out to give Kirama some more time to be free but maintaining a barrier can burn through one's reserves faster than they'd expect and if Kakashi were maintaining one side then he may be nearing his limit. He watched as the fox arose to his full height. It really was awesome. No man-made monument or structure could compare. Naruto considered how things would have been if people hadn't reflexively feared or envied the biju. If they were looked upon with wonder, instead. Maybe one day, he thought as he prepared himself to finish this. It's time to end this, Kirama. He shouted and the fox cracked a grin as he charged. Naruto met his charge, his pace increasing as his third clone dispelled causing Naruto to slip into sage mode. 
he performed a sequence of hand signs Kirama knew well and hated dearly. Ox horse bore snake, wood style, wood golem jutsu, Naruto called out for effect. Kirama stopped his charge, choosing to charge a biju bomb instead. He truly hated all things Mokutan. However, his progress was halted when he felt himself once again teleported. This time he appeared in the sky and saw a clone on a clay bird giving him a cheeky grin. The proud fox didn't even have time to swat at it before the golem grabbed him and threw him on his back. Sage art, gracious deity gates, Naruto called from atop his wood construction. Nine gates appeared, crashing through the top of the barrier, each pinning a tail down to the ground. Now that the tails were controlled and Kirama was on his back he could finish this. With but a fought the golem loomed over Kirama and began to mercilessly tickle the mass of chakra. Kirama fought it for as long as he could be sooner than he'd like he began to laugh. Ah ha ha stop it. He demanded. His voice deep and raspy. You gotta give before I'll stop. Ha 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 fine. Ha 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 I give. You win. Ha ha ha. As soon as Kirama conceded Naruto stopped his assault and removed the deity gates and dispelled the wood golem. Kirama returned to his feet, now towering over the boy that had just bested him. He could see Naruto smiling, not that he won but out of enjoyment. The Kyuubai held his fist out, certain this wouldn't be a mistake. Naruto reciprocated. The Uzumaki didn't fight the sensation of being engulfed by the red, bubbling chakra. He allowed it to enter his system and once he was all absorbed he stood still. It didn't take long to feel both halves of Kirama become one. Naruto smiled once more, his friend was whole again and got to play for a bit. It wasn't much, certainly less than the fox deserved but he hoped it was something. He felt Kirama's agreement. As he looked around, he witnessed his clone already repairing much of the damage done. The biggest problem being the two ice constructs he created. Looks like the land of fire is about to get a new lake, Naruto thought. The Uzumaki started walking toward the village in moments the barrier was done and he was surrounded by the eight onlookers. Juriya grabbed his godson and put him into a headlock. See, sensei, I only train the best and it is only the methods of the gallant Juriya that would allow one to stand up to the Kyuubai. The toad sage exclaimed, holding up a peace sign with his free hand. Yes, Juria kun I'm sure you showed him to secrets of the Mokutan. The Sandame observed Riley causing Juria to deflate just a little. His concentration dipping, Naruto slipped out of the hold and pushed the larger man off him. What the hell, man? Trying to make me look uncool, Databeo. Don't be so vain, brat. Your beloved sensei has just been attacked. A good student would defend my honor. What honor, you shitty pervert? Stop bragging about stuff all the time and people wouldn't cut you down, Titebeo. The ANBU in attendance watched in disbelief as the teenager that just defeated the Kyuubai, using the Mokutan no less, bickered with one of the Sanum-like school children. You know, Naruto-kun, Kakashi interrupted. Any chance you had at that spar went down the drain after what I just witnessed. Come on, kakashi Nii, don't be like that. We can keep it strictly Teijutsu if you want, Naruto offered. Juriya's vehement head shake informed Kakashi that was still a bad idea. Ma, ma, what about a thrilling game of rock, paper, scissors? Why are all the men in my life lame? Naruto cried in mock distress. Kyukikuku, it's okay, Naruto-kun, the snake san and comforted, having slide right beside the red-haired shinobi. He favored her with a face-splitting grin. The sandam watched as the two slipped into an easy rapport. The very sight of it turned something in him sour. He thought back to Naruto's last words to him, just for once, trust me. Had that been a large part of his problem? How many people had counseled him, warned him, done all they could to deter him from continually trying to entrap his former student? Had he lost the ability to trust in the judgment of others? Had he truly become that arrogant? Consumed with his thoughts, the Sandame didn't notice they had arrived at the village's gates. Scores of Konoha shinobi and civilians were present. The longtime Hakage watched as Naruto dodged a punch from Tsunade, retaliating with a hug and quiet words shared only between the two. He heard the last of the Senju inform Naruto several of the Hyuga were able to see and narrate the fight. She encouraged him to address the crowd, the panic having subsided. Naruto looked unsure, a sign of his lack of faith in the villagers but Tsunade's resolve broke through. He watched as the boy, no, young man took tentative steps towards the mass of people, all eyes on him. Nearly 17 years ago a tragedy befell the village. Many were lost, even more scarred physically and mentally by the event. What many didn't know was that day was supposed to be a happy one. The start of a family. It wouldn't happen. When a female Jinchuriki gives birth her seal weakens. A man claiming to be Madara Uchiha took advantage of that time and not even 10 minutes into the world he took me hostage. Forcing my father to protect me, this self-proclaimed Madara abducted by mother and released the Kyuubai upon the village. He then controlled the Kyuubai and made him attack. 
The rest most of you know. The fourth battled the Kyubai and in his final act he sealed half of the chakra beast into himself and half into his son. Me. Naruto ignored the gasps heard throughout the crowd. The sealing jutsu my father used trapped him and his half of the Kyubai within the stomach of the Shinigami. Somehow he was released from his eternal prison and allowed to go to the pure land. However, a dead person cannot contain a biju and the yin half of the Kyubai was released into the world. I didn't know how long it would take to reform. The Kyubai had never been so injured he had to disperse. It was much, much faster than I anticipated. As the Hyuga clan told you, I'm sure, the free half of the Kyubai agreed to enter the seal and I now contain the entirety of the fox. Knowing he did not attack of his own volition may not change how any of you view him. You may not be able to forgive his deeds. I won't fault you as, truthfully, I haven't forgiven many of you either, Naruto said. Much of the attendants looked down in shame, remembering how they ostracized the fox boy. How many people looked at him with fear or disdain and wished he would just go away. It was embarrassing for them to think that this boy was the son of their great hero, who many of them would openly worship in front of the boy. But I don't hate you. Even when I was at my lowest and my feelings about the village were the worst, I never wanted to hurt you. I just wanted to be free of your hatred. For better or worse, Kanoha is my home. My family, my teammates, and my sensei are here. My duty is to protect this village, and I will do so to the best of my abilities. Maybe in time we can become something more and truly embody the will of fire that the Hokage of the past did. When Naruto was done talking, he took Orochimaru's hand and teleported away. He didn't hear when Tsunade, Haruzen, and Jiraiya all agreed with parts of his story. He wouldn't have cared. The people either believed him or they didn't. He only wanted to be by himself. In an instant they arrived at her door and Naruto felt her tense. He turned toward her and she looked concerned. He didn't understand why. Orochi-chan, what's wrong? I'm not surprised after what's happened it slipped your mind. The room Kabuto was trying to gain access to. I was going to show it to you and explain everything. If you don't want, I need to. You deserve to know. Just, however you respond, no nothing I did was to hurt you. The snake Sanin felt a pair of warm lips meet her own as her cheeks were cupped. It was a short kiss, more tender than what they normally shared but the feeling of reassurance it sparked was welcomed. Whatever it is, it'll be okay, Naruto said. She gave him a nod and took him to her office. She removed a book from a shelf against the back wall. The way of tea, Naruto realized and smiled. It was a favorite of Anko's. Orochi opened the book and placed her hand on a hidden seal, opening a secret door. Naruto continued to follow her down the stone corridor and the stairwell until they reached the bottom. She used activated another seal to open yet another door and sitting at a table was someone in a hooded robe. I guess it's about that time, the decidedly masculine voice said. Orochimaru didn't answer him, but instead talked to Naruto. Naruto-kun, this is Abaido Uchiha, but you know him as Madara, Orochimaru said. She didn't know what to expect, but if she had to guess, she wouldn't guess laughter. He pointed at the Uchiha and said, All that training I did to kill you and my girlfriend seems to have kicked your ass, Databayo. Abaido couldn't help but laugh at that. Naji Hyuga walked through the village as he tried to figure out what to do with some new information he had just learned. Most of it made sense on its own, but when put together, it was a puzzle he couldn't solve. Naruto's fight with the Kyuubai happened right in front of him, and he watched as someone a year younger than him sparred with the strongest of the legendary chakra beasts. It looked more like a boy playing with his dog than like a fight to the death. As if that wasn't strange enough, the prodigy Hyuuga saw the Uzumaki use two bloodline limits, Hayaten and the legendary Mokuten, which made it even more strange that Naruto won. How? How was it possible to use multiple bloodline limits at the same time? Was Naruto born with special skills, a result of what Orochimaru tried? Both. Even if he had legendary genes or amazing scientific discoveries, the red-haired ninja still had to train his abilities and use a special version of the Rakage lightning armor. Powerful. He didn't know much about the younger Shinobi's skills, but he knew when he saw power. He had been after it his whole life. He thought he was the best of his generation, with the Uchiha coming in a close second. He thought that failing the Chunin exams was just a fluke. Neji could no longer fool himself after the fight with the Kyuubai. Neji was just as shocked by what Naruto said as he was by the battle with the giant fox. The former branch member was able to figure out that the people of Konoha probably didn't like the boy because they didn't know his background and because the fact that he was a container was a widely known secret. He thought back to what the Aburame had said at that meeting and he had to agree with the bug user. He only saw what Naruto had, and he never asked himself what he was missing or what he had lost. This didn't make sense to Neji. Fate was fixed and punished those who tried to change it. 
When Neji met the Uzumaki for the first time, he thought he was a loser or, at best, just average. Years later, when that same boy had been trained by two of the Sanin, he had shown that he was anything but average. Neji couldn't decide what would happen to Naruto, the outcast pariah or the force to be reckoned with. He shouldn't have been able to move between the two. It was a fact that winners and losers were picked at birth. By blood, Naruto was the best. He was destined to fail because of what happened to him, which was the plan of fate. Why wasn't Neji able to figure it out? Why wasn't he able to see it? How did he seem to have been able to fight fate? Or did he just change the way it was going? The Hyuga was not aware of it, didn't like not knowing. Because he had eyes that could see everything, he rarely had to be in the dark. But he never came to any conclusions. Only the fact that Naruto Uzumaki was a mystery. While Neji was trying to deal with his faith crisis, Tsunade was busy giving Jiraiya and Haruzen the evil eye. When she got back to her office and sat down, she didn't bother to hide her anger and disappointment with the two. She chose Jiraiya to start with. What the fuck, you stupid jerk. She yelled, a vein on her forehead bulging. Just because the word has toad in it doesn't mean it makes sense now. Haim, said Jiraiya. He knew he couldn't calm Tsunade down, so he thought it would be best to let her get angry so they could talk. How dare you try to be funny to me now. I'll kick you so hard you'll see the earth curve. That sounds painful. Don't do that, Jiraiya said in a neutral tone. As soon as he said it, Tsunade punched her desk and grabbed Jiraiya by the collar. You better watch it, Jiraiya. It's one thing for Sensei to act behind my back, which I expect because he doesn't care about anyone's opinion but his own, she said, ignoring Haruzen's frown at her assessment. But I trusted you to tell me the truth and respect that I am Hokage. Tsunade, I do trust you. This wasn't an attempt to get around you. At best, I could tell you that the sky might fall someday. And in reality, what could you have done to get ready for this that wouldn't have killed hundreds or thousands of people? If any of us had attacked the Kyuubai, he would have fought back with all his strength. If you had tried to use Itachi or Sasuke, assuming they were as strong as Madara or that he was able to stop the Kyuubai with just his sharing him, it would have been worse. Aruto told me himself that the fox hates the Uchiha. All of them, no exceptions. Tenzo, to be honest, isn't strong enough to stop a Biju, and the only seal users who might be able to do something are all redheads. Tsunade quickly thought about what he was saying. She didn't have an answer to most of what he said, but it wasn't up to him to decide when he'd tell the whole village about a threat. Tsunade told Jiraiya that very thing, and he agreed and said he was sorry. Then, the god aim went to Haruzen. How much of your legacy, how much of your remaining time, and how many of your relationships are you going to ruin trying to get back at Orochi? I told you I wouldn't let you work behind my back, but you turned one of my ninja into a secret asset and had him spy on a high-ranking member of the village. You had no right to do that. I had every right. You didn't have to sort through the dead babies like I did. You didn't have to chase her out of the village like I did. You just support her in this weird relationship she has with Naruto-kun. You should be protecting him instead of encouraging this farce. So, knowing she hadn't changed, I made a plan. It didn't work, but I'm not wrong about her. If you keep pushing, you won't have to deal with her, Juria said, thinking back to a conversation he had with his godson earlier. Sensei, you're backing Naruto into a corner, and I don't know why you can't see it. He just played with the Kyuubai, and it took you, Enma, Gamabunta, Minato, and Kushina to restrain and seal it. What do you think you can do to someone like that? You may think you're protecting Naruto, but he'll protect Orochimaru. It's time to move on. Several of us have tried to talk you out of this vendetta, this quest to get her out of the village. You won't listen, no matter what it has cost you. You tried to kill her, Sensei. The daimyo could have had you executed. You had to resign in disgrace and you'll never be friends with Naruto again. Of course not. But people don't just change, Tsunade-chan. She's wanted Naruto for years, Tsunade-chan. She's manipulated things, maybe even him, for who knows how long. Do you think they're even close to equals? He's a lonely young man, and she's used her cunning to take advantage of his weakness. Tsunade asked, like she did with you as the implication. Have you been telling yourself that she seduced you? What makes you so sure she didn't? Tsunade yelled, because I'm not fucking stupid. She took a few deep breaths to calm down and push her anger away. It wouldn't be right for her to kill her teacher. This is your last warning. If you do anything against her again, I'll lock up what's left of you in your compound. We still have one more problem. There's no way that I and Anoki won't find out, Tsunade told the two men. Juria whispered, strength and bites challenge, and he wondered if his last student could see into the future. Juria, what is that? Naruto said earlier that strength begs for a challenge. Haruzen said, the problem is that Naruto's known skills just give Anoki an excuse to do what he was going to do anyway. 
you probably won't know where he stands until the Chunin exams. Tsunade agreed with a nod, but she wished she knew more about the fence sitter. After his laughing fit was over, Naruto sat down next to the person who killed his parents and changed his whole life. The only thing between them was the width of the stainless steel table. Naruto looked at the Uchiha's face. His eyes were a strange mix of brown and green, which meant that someone had probably taken his sharing and eyes. He had scars on his face, which showed that he had been through some very bad things. The man looked tired or maybe resigned, like he had just given up and accepted whatever would happen. The head of the Uzumaki clan didn't know what to tell the man. He had no plans to talk to him, not even to say something funny as the man went away. He only wanted to kill him. So what? It wouldn't be too much of a stretch to think that he had to deal with some of Orochi's more questionable urges. He looked broken, and even though Naruto didn't care about how he felt, that didn't give him much reason to hit the Uchiha. Some people might think it's silly that Naruto wasn't blindly motivated to get revenge on this man for all the pain he caused him and everything he took away. But for Naruto, that was the reason why he couldn't put revenge first. What could he do to the person who took his parents and made everyone in the village hate him, then set up a group of monsters to find him and kill him? Naruto thought that he would have to break the rules of space and time just to get into the realm of vengeance. Yes, he could kill him now for what he did in the past. No one could find anything wrong with what he said, but it still felt empty. He was ready to stop a threat, and from all appearances, that's what he did. Naruto also looked for the Hurishin mark that his father had put on the man, and he found it. Once he reached for a marker, he didn't forget it, so this Abido guy wouldn't get a normal racing into the back this time. Naruto asked, why? In the end, he didn't know if finding out why this person did what he did would help or hurt him, but he had to find out. Obito replied, the easy answer is a girl. If you destroy this village because you couldn't find a date, I'll kill you, he said. It looked like he could find a reason after all. Abido raised his arms in a fake surrender and said, Whoa, whoa, whoa. I didn't do it, despite what many people might think. It was one of my genin teammates, along with Kakashi. You are a student of my father's. Naruto was surprised to hear this. He wasn't aware of that. Yes, Rin wasn't just a girl I had a crush on. To give you some background, the Uchiha clan wasn't popular when I was young. And even among the Uchiha, I was seen as an oddball and a failure. I learned early on that life could be cruel for no reason. As Naruto got wrapped up in Kirama's chakra cloak, he said, You know what? Just hold out your fist, and this will go faster. The two men fought, and Naruto saw everything. Obito's childhood, how he loves and gets along with Rin, and how he and Kakashi are rivals. He saw how much the Uchiha respected his father and how he helped the Uchiha deal with being in Kakashi's shadow. He saw the mission go wrong and what happened afterward. He saw the real Madara mess with people's minds, and he saw Rin give up her life. He didn't find it easy to feel like the world was coming apart at the seams. It was everything and could go on forever. Naruto saw the real Madara take a broken boy and warp him, breaking or twisting everything Abido believed in. He saw a boy grow up, give up on this world, and become a young man. He watched that fateful night and every year after as master and student fought without knowing it. The Akatsuki's change and the trouble they caused for Kiri. It was a story of sadness and violence that made almost everyone worse off. As soon as the link was broken, Naruto turned off the chakra mode and got himself together. She made it all make sense. Yes, I thought the world was good because she was in it. Madara had me so twisted to his cause that I never thought what I was doing was disrespectful to her. This world wasn't real, so it didn't matter, Habido said. Orochimaru helped me realize that Madara probably set me up to see Rin die because he knew that would make me give up on everything. Naruto sat in silence and thought about what he had just learned. Abido had been a lonely kid who just wanted to be noticed, and that was a feeling that a lot of people could relate to. The Uzumaki couldn't ignore how one of the best ninjas ever broke and used the young man, who was still a child. How he thought he was making sure other people would never really know what he did. Naruto couldn't understand that level of sadness, but he did remember how hard it was when Hinata died, even though they hadn't been friends in years. Pain begets pain. He had seen it with Abido, and Orochi-chan was stuck in this cycle, even if she would never admit it. Jiria was right about the hate cycle. Revenge is the futile desire to make up for something that doesn't exist in the universe. Naruto never thought of himself as vengeful, but that was before he had to face himself and his long-buried hatred. If he went through a few different things, he'd be like Abido, who had the right to hurt other people and the permission to never feel bad about it. The special Jounin asked, so, what now? Abido seemed surprised when he was asked if the way his eyes got bigger was a good sign. I honestly don't know. After what I did to you, I thought you'd kill me without a second thought. Killing you wouldn't bring my parents back or give me a happy childhood. 
That doesn't mean I forgive you or anything like that. But you dead does nothing for me. I don't know if there is redemption for you. But there really isn't if you're dead. There isn't. After everything I've done, there's just no going back. I accept it. The irony is that I was so determined to see Rin again in this world that I made sure I wouldn't in the next. No torture could hurt more than that. Albedo was wrong. And Naruto wanted to tell him so, if not for the Uchiha's sake, then for his own. He wanted to believe that you could make up for your mistakes as long as you were still alive. But the slights from his past fought against the desire. Even with this new information, he wasn't sure how he could truly forgive Albedo. He hadn't forgiven the villagers or the old man. He didn't hate any of these people, but it would be a long time before he could truly forgive and accept them. As he spoke, questions that didn't have easy answers kept going through his mind. I am credited with putting an end to a rebellion in Iron Country. The chief architect, Ido Watanabe, trained me for a little while. He talked a lot about his late daughter, Ritsu, and how when she was young, she would say she'd be the first female samurai of Iron Country. He said she was brave and headstrong. She didn't want to be stuck in the role that was given to her. They argued a lot about it. Now, even with training, there was no guarantee that she would have lived, but she definitely wouldn't have lived without it. It broke him, and he almost quit his job, only training a few students in a private school and letting them test into official service. He also became an advocate for a more equal iron country, which put him at odds with Mifune. The next day, I was with Mifune's granddaughter, Tomo, when we were surrounded by dozens of Ito's former and current students. They said calmly that they were deposing Mifune and that as an outsider, I could leave. The implication was that they were going to kill Tomo. I think you didn't leave her, he said. I killed all of them. But ninja arts are against the law in Iron Country. You would have been arrested even if you had tried to protect his granddaughter. Didn't use any ninja skills, just my sword. After protecting her, I found Ito and we had a duel. What struck me was his smile, even as he lay dying. It makes me wonder if he knew this was the likely outcome. If I hadn't been willing to sacrifice one person, he'd have put me in a position to sacrifice many. Albedo told him, you can't think that way. You can't carry that weight. I never learned to harden my heart, so when Rin died, it broke, and I turned into a monster. But it's all connected. It's a never-ending web of actions and their results. But that's not what I want to talk about. For some people, I'm a hero. For others, I might be a villain. But the truth is that Tomo's governess turned attendant poisoned me before the fight. I didn't realize it at the time, but for most of the fight, I wasn't even seeing Tomo anymore. So, I wasn't a hero or a villain. I was just a drugged 15-year-old doing the best I could. That's probably true for all of us. We're neither the best nor the worst things we've ever done. Albedo nodded, and Naruto got up to leave. Orochimaru was still standing in the doorway. As Naruto got to the door, Albedo asked, How did you figure out you were hallucinating? You said you weren't even aware of it, so how did you figure it out? The next day, Tomo came to say goodbye to Juria and me because neither of us wanted to stay. As we were saying our goodbyes, she asked me if I was really okay to travel. I told her I was, but she didn't seem to believe me, so I asked why. She said that during the fight, my attempts to reassure her were a mixed bag because I was calling her some other girl's name. When Naruto and Orochimaru left, the mood was very sad. Orochi slides up next to Naruto and gives him a kiss on the cheek to make things more fun. Naruto is shocked and asks, what was that about? Because it's clear that I was the woman you were hallucinating about. Hyukuku, my Naruto-kun is so brave. If you keep doing that, one day I might fall in love with you. Naruto laughed and then said, the one time I tried to protect you, I messed up horribly and got my behind handed to me. The thought is what counts, said Orochi. Naruto said, you don't really believe that, which finally made her laugh. No, but it sounded good, he said. When they got back to her study, they went back to silence. Once everything was done, Orochi led Naruto to her living room, where they sat down on her couch. She said, I'm sure you have more questions. Naruto said as he tickled her side, like the pair of Sharingans you've been hiding. It makes me feel better that you broke through my genjutsu. He really didn't care that she had them. I only put one in myself in case you ever wanted an upgrade, too. But that's not all, Orochi said after a short pause. She wasn't used to being nervous, but she had to admit to herself that she cared what Naruto thought of her. She was sure she knew what not to do, but even a hint of disappointment would affect her more than she liked. If I wasn't the person you saw when you were poisoned, I can guess who it was based on the timing, so let's start there. Naruto-kun, Hinata is still alive. As Tsunade and her group got closer to the entrance to Tsuna, she asked, How does anyone stand this heat? Since the second Kyuubai incident, the weeks had gone by in a flash. Things went back to normal in the village, except that Naruto became a new star. As punishment for not telling her nephew about the Kyuubai, she lowered the price for him to learn from her. 
Anyone with the equivalent payout of a D-rank mission could get the son of the Yondame to teach them Nin, Gen, Ken, or Teijutsu, and he could not use shadow clones to fulfill the requests nor shortchange Hanabi. True, she only keep it at that price point for three weeks but the lesson was learned. You can regulate your body temperature so you're only complaining about the idea of the heat. Tsunade Chan, Orochi pointed out, teasingly. She and Kakashi were covered in tan, lightweight cloaks and shemog. Tsunade was in traditional red and white Hokage robes with the diamond shape hat to match. The god aim ignored her friend, feeling it was her right to complain about the desert heat regardless of how affected she actually was by it. The trio approached the valley entrance and were greeted by Temuri. After an exchange of pleasantries and a security check, they were escorted to the arena. Orochi noticed the village was in much better condition compared to the last time she was here. What really stood out was a lush and green oasis with fruit-bearing trees and various ponds. It was, apparently, treated as a playground as children were seen throughout. Tsunade noticed the environmental anomaly as well. I haven't been inside Suna in a number of years but that oasis looks newish, Temuri san Oh, yes, god aim Sama. It was a gift to Suna, who could gift such a thing. The god aim inquired. No one but Keiskij Sama knows. It simply appeared one night. Keiskij Sama said it was from a personal friend and left it at that. That wasn't remotely true. Everyone in Suna knew who made it just like they all knew who Gara's only acknowledged friend was but unlike some villages, the residents of Suna knew how to keep their mouths closed. Arriving to the arena, Temuri walked the Konoha Nin to location of the other cage. The area was open except for a sandstone ceiling, offering shade and temperature control. Temuri introduced Tsunade and took her position behind Gara along with Baki. All five cage were in attendance, Gara and Tsunade having worked out her arriving last. It was meant to send a subtle message that Gara didn't require his closest ally in attendance with the other cage present, as the young wind shadow stood on his own. Tsunade took her seat as her party got into position, having removed their travel wear. You cut it awfully close, Tsunade Haim, Anoki said, a mocking tone to his voice. That's the arrogance of Konoha Ninja. Even their pissy brat Jenin have it while having accomplished nothing. I barked, his head resting on top one of his hands. Tsunade chose to ignore the rakage. I'm sure you understand a ninja should neither be too early nor too late. Tsuchikage Dono, Tsunade responded. The fence sitter said nothing in retort. I have to admit. Tsunade Sama, I am disappointed your delegation didn't include Naruto Uzumaki. I understand him to have several treasures of Kiri and would love to work out a fair exchange. Item by item if need be, the goddamn Mizukich purred. Tsunade could sense a slight tensing behind her and hoped Orochimaru wouldn't reveal herself to be a jealous girlfriend now of all times. I hear the brat isn't allowed out of the sights of Jureya. How that boy going to ever be a man if you keep a minder on him? I am sure Naruto would be flattered by your interest in his development, Rakage Dono. As far as these Kiri treasures, I know not of what you speak but if you would like to present a formal request I will, of course, give it all due consideration. Mizukage Dono. May simply smiled having gotten the answer she expected. I tightened his grip on his chair and clenched his jaw, angered at having been dismissed again. Although, I also hear whispers that he has the most potential of any shinobi of any village since the Shadai Hakage himself defeated the very Kyuubai Minato was said to have killed with no help from anyone. Konoha is just a factory for genius ninja. Was there a point, Rakage Dono? Just remarking on your village's ability to churn out bullshit Superman stories about your alleged prodigies while you hide them away. At least Minato was out in the field so I could take his measure. Hyukuku, from my understanding it was Minato-kun who took yours, Orochimaru retorted, much to the ire of Kumo's leader. Whatever stories you may have heard and however they have come to be, you must choose for yourself whether or not to believe them. We in Kanoha like to concern ourselves with ourselves, Tsunade added. History would tell another story. Onoki countered, referencing Kanoha's participation in all three shinobi wars. With the exchange having died down Gara called an official start to the finals. As the five shadows of the ninja world watched a proxy for war, several could only think about the real thing. And while they were preoccupied with the thoughts of war their seconds were vigilant for any signs of aggression. All except one. The most infamous woman in the hidden villages wasn't concerned with war or children exchanging love taps. She only wanted to get this trip over with so she could share the good news. Tsunade confirmed herself, eight weeks along. Naruto-kun would have an heir, a child of his own. And she'd tap into previously unexplored reserves of cruelty and sadism if anyone should attempt to harm his child. It was a promise of a lifetime. Frail and defeated were a far cry from how Shino had started his day. 
He was so confident in his victory that Kanoha would burn under his superior might, intelligence, and technology. It had all gone so smoothly it felt like fate. And thanks to Zetsu, he even had enough information to reliably target Yuzumaki Naruto and Uchiha Sasuke. His longtime associate never revealed why he wanted them to die in particular but it didn't matter, as he was going to have as many Kanoha killed as possible anyway. It all went wrong. The Sky Fortress was infiltrated and his ninja killed before initial takeoff. The Uzumaki and Ahiwuga took turns dismantling him, showing him that rapid regeneration wasn't always a boon. He was stabbed and cut repeatedly, burned, electrocuted, drowned, made paralyzed by gentle fist strikes. The Uzumaki sealed the Zero Tails as if it were a mere academy exercise. With the Zero Tails gone and his chakra system compromised Shino had to suffer through a Jinjutsu of being torn apart by panthers under a blood-red moon. His current location was interrogation as, he assumed, the village's best went to work. He'd already given up Ai and Zetsu's involvement. He didn't know what more they wanted but the purple-haired woman just wouldn't leave him be. He was so tired and his once muscular frame had withered to near nothingness. What more do you want? He asked. Oh, I'm just curious about something. Seems like you could have been taken in without much fuss but those two boys worked you over. So, what did you do to piss one or both of them off? Shino groaned at the memory. A piece of intel Zetsu had given him about the Yuzumaki's relationship with his former associate, Orochimaru. He goaded the boy, suggesting there was more to their relationship than was true. By the time he said she'd do anything for an immortality jutsu he felt a sword through his heart. He dropped to the ground in shock and when he looked up, those blue eyes weren't even angry. They were filled with pity. The Uzumaki then said something to the Hyuga about assholes always making things personal, and never knowing when to shut up. Shino was a smart man and had no intention of repeating what he said to Orochimaru's sadistic student. Anko laughed at his silence as she resolved to get the full story from Naruto when he got back. Karabi, Yujito called, attempting to get her fellow Jinchuriki's attention. He seemed, not distracted but lost or in a state of disbelief. They were currently in the land of rivers, as B insisted they come support Rakage plan Sama's ambush. It was unusual for him to be so serious. Yo, yo, where's Big Bro's main man to carry out the master plan? He inquired. She couldn't answer that as Dodai should have been here, along with the hundred other ninja assigned. But there were also no signs of combat. The scene looked undisturbed. Pristine. Almost perfect. She looked at Karabi in shock as the real meaning of his question sank in. You think Konoha and Orsuna intercepted Dodai's ambush and cleaned up to this extent? Mr. Nine minutes zero applied the pressure and let the pipe burst, treated our best like they were light work. Mighty Eight senses his bro, the Uzumaki's a pro. Yujito scowled at some of her comrades seemingly being wiped out by one boy without a trace. It made everything Aisama said about him seem true. Konoha had prepped a secret weapon with a grudge against Kumo. It also suggested the attack on Konoha failed or the Uzumaki would have been otherwise occupied. They had tipped their hand and were now fully exposed. Do we try to catch him? Yujito asked. B didn't answer immediately as he mulled over their options. Crossing into the land of wind would be seen as an act of war and while they had all but declared as much against Kanoha, they had not with Suna. However, if his brother learned the ambush failed and Dodai was killed he would react with pure emotion, namely rage. He didn't know if his brother could best two of the Sanin and had a Kakashi but he knew he couldn't handle all three of them Kanoha's Jinchuriki. It wasn't even about which was the smart move, there were none. But deciding the least bad option, a sense of dread originated in his stomach and spread ever so slowly throughout his body. He feared today may be a watershed, that something irrevocable may happen. If that were the case then he needed to be by his brother's side because whatever his faults that was still his family. We creep on the low but push hard in case big bro blows. Ijito nodded and the pair departed without further delay. I noticed she subtly stiffened, a sigh his center nin had become alerted to something concerning. The second of his escort duo was no coward so for something to worry him, even slightly, was worth paying attention to. A low-level drone pulled away the Kaiskij sister, the snake Sanin following behind her. He felt the need to at least mention this as if this were a hit. He'd let them know they'd hidden it poorly. Onoki was simply quicker. My my, the two allied nations' escorts seemed to be departing. One might assume something nefarious, Kaiskij don't know. I assure you I wish none here any harm. And you, Tsunade Haim. You allow the snake free reign, should we ready for battle? If you aren't always ready for battle, Onoki Dono, I'd suggest you retire. Any follow-up response by Onoki was cut off by the snicker of the Mizukage and the return of the Keizukage sister and Orochimaru, the snake Sanin smiling from ear to ear. The wind mistress approached Gara, whispering something I could not hear and watched the child cage nod. 
The girl departed briefly but returned with a guest in tow, Yuzumaki Naruto. It was eyes turned to stiffen. The attack on Konoha was scheduled for today, and he was sure the brat hadn't be allowed out of the village since his return. Either Shino crossed him or something went wrong. Honestly, I just wanted the delusional man to cause a lot of structural damage so he hoped the fool managed that. No, what truly concerned him was the contingent of 100 John and Shinobi he had stationed in the land of rivers led by his attendant, Dadai. The boy didn't have a scratch on him and while that could be explained as far as wounds, even his clothes were pristine. I gritted his teeth. It was highly unlikely he managed to avoid his ninja. More than likely Minato's bastard killed them and then strolled into Suna as if nothing had occurred. I took the briefest moment to acknowledge the sacrifice of his ninja and the loss of his loyal companion. Thought I would be dearly missed. I was afforded this show of reverence, even if hidden because all eyes drifted to the red-haired shinobi. They watched as Gara stood up and greeted his fellow container as a friend and an equal. A handshake and a half-hug followed by words of welcome. Naruto greeted the rest of the cage, begging their forgiveness for the intrusion. With no additional seating, Kenkuro offered his place and left the viewing area. I finally took a good look at the young man, not having seen any updated pictures of him besides what Rasa provided. Juria had been maddeningly efficient in neutralizing all of I's intelligence agents, killing each one until I simply stopped sending them. The Toad Sanin hadn't lost a step and it frustrated the rakage greatly. Decent height for his age, tone but nothing too impressive. The boy had too much of his mother in him looking very little like his rival in speed. But what I noticed, and detested the most, was the boy's ease. All five cage and this child that has never seen true war stands amongst them as an unspoken equal. The very thought made the rakage's blood boil. Then I remembered Dodai. He was too seasoned to believe his man wasn't dead, killed by a mere child who now stands in the same room as I as if he's done nothing. Or as if I could do nothing to him. Arrogant, gallingly arrogant. I barely pay his attention to the rest of the exams. Children's slap boxing holds no interest. He needed an outlet for his rage and grief. He needed to take action but his current circumstances demanded he temper his natural inclinations. The exams ended and the boy cage gave a speech before closing out the ceremonies. I was ushered into what passed for quality accommodations in Suna. The sand rat had requested the cage and their parties attend a banquet before they departed, starting two hours after the end of the exams. He needed to think, he needed to plan. Naruto gave Tsunade, or Chimaru, and Kakashi a full accounting of events that transpired to bring him to Suna and the god aim was furious. At herself for believing I would attack Odo first, it was too indirect for him and she'd been too clever by half and put her village at risk. At I for both planned attacks, and for her favorite Gaki, she saw it in his eyes, the kind of tired that wasn't of the body nor the mind. Just the weight of death and having delivered a great deal of it. Few truly knew what that felt like. Even fewer knew what it was to be able to kill some of the best of the elemental nations before they could even attempt to fight, surrender, run away or call for help. With all the training they do to perfect being assassins, striking enemies where they are most vulnerable there is still something about the challenge of a fight that gives one a sense of honor, of humanity. When that challenge is gone you can start to feel like a butcher. She'd seen that look on Jurya's face before he took in the AIM trio. She'd seen it in her own eyes. Are you okay? She heard Kakashi ask. Naruto initially shrugged in response but the five eyes on him demanded an actual response. It is what it is. They were there for a tussle, they got one. I'm not going to sink into the pits of despair over it. Naruto said, pouring himself a glass of water. All watched as a layer of frost enveloped the glass before he took a drink. Tsunade knew that wasn't really the truth, and yet, it wasn't a lie but a resolution to endure. More importantly, what is to be done about I? Hyukuku, clearly he doesn't return to Kumo, nor his escorts. Orochi chimed in. Tsunade didn't immediately respond. Her fellow Sanin wasn't wrong. I had to die. It was the removal of a potential reasonable actor, Darui, that bothered her. Well, one of the things that could get messy, Kakashi added but didn't disagree. I played his hand and was exposed that didn't go unpunished. I can do it clean, and being in two places at once is no problem, Naruto said after taking another drink, savoring the cold liquid. No chance for an ambush, she is a censor. He made you before any of us knew you were here, said Kakashi. That's fine. Besides, I knows. If what I've been told about him is true, he'll want to show it down so the censor will do half my job for me. I could go as additional backup, Orochi offered. No, Tsunade said, voice firm indicating there would be no argument. 
Orochi, I need you with me as we go back with our participants. The two males in the room could tell that wasn't the whole truth but let it drop when Orochimaru didn't protest. So, do I have the all clear? Let's see how this dinner plays out. If Iwa has sided with Kumo they may reveal it there. If so, Anoki needs to also be dealt with. Could you handle that, Naruto? Yes. What's wrong, old man? Hirotsuchi asked. Her grandfather had been pacing since they entered their suite and hadn't stopped. She'd withheld asking until the rooms were thoroughly swept and she was reasonably sure it was safe to speak. I was angered when the Uzumaki joined us. That by itself means very little. The man has been preparing for war against Kanoha and using Minato's boy as a propaganda tool from the start. No, it wasn't the anger that vexes me, Anoki explained as he continued to pace. He thought back to Ai's expression. The slight widening of the eyes, rapid blinking followed thereafter. Then the anger sat in. Of all the sitting cage, he was the worst at hiding his emotions having always led by strength and strength alone. He was surprised. Before anything else, he was surprised the boy was there. That's not so shocking, Onoki-sama. You don't expect a Jinchuriki to just show up somewhere, Akatsuchi reasoned. No, I don't think that's it. It is well known the Keisuke and the Yuzumaki are friends. I think I has something planned and the boy being here jeopardizes it. There may be an opportunity here. If Ai's little scheme fails then it is possible he will fall. If he dies that increases our bargaining power, and we could cut a great deal with the newest rakage. If any or all of the Kanoha party dies then it's war and we let the two fight it out and potentially pick the scraps. Maybe an alliance with Kiri to target the weakest village. Maybe Adsuna as well. If both I and the Namikaze Hellspawn were to perish then wouldn't that just be a reason to celebrate? Both villages dropping in power and prestige. A power vacuum would serve us well. Set us up nicely for the future, the old man muttered. Yay, but what if the entire Kumo delegation dies? Then the new rakage would likely be that insufferable Karabi, and he isn't fit for the job but also won't be moved to fight out of vengeance. We need Darui to survive. If the rakage dies, Kuratuski asked. Onoki nodded and neither of his companions said anything more but Kuratsuchi thought her grandfather made things needlessly complex with his waffling for an advantage. She held no love for any village but her own and detested the yellow flash like all right thinking you went in. But the benefits of war seemed way too hypothetical and abstract to her. Kumo had already shown itself to be untrustworthy when they tried to kidnap the Hyuga heiress, regardless of how I tried to spin it. She worried her grandfather was moving past aged wisdom to the realm of a relic unable to contend with or absorb new ways of thinking. We really need to get our intelligence network up to par, May said in frustration. Like the other cage, she saw Ai's reaction and knew something was awry. The problem was, what information she had was so sparse she could do little but speculate. And while it wouldn't serve her to be ignorant of the tensions of the other villages, it was of no great value to get involved. Kiri wasn't weak but it was not the time to test its hard-won stability, not unless absolutely necessary. Maybe there would be a play, some advantage to exploit but from where May sat doing nothing was the correct course for now. Things may come to a head tonight. Stay diligent but do not make unnecessary moves. Let these mainlanders handle their own problems. As of right now none of them are active threats to Kiri. The Uzumaki clan head with several of our famed swords suggests otherwise, May Sama Ao remarked. Well, he seems like a reasonable, young man. I'm sure he and I could reach a satisfactory agreement given the chance. Oh, or I could challenge him, May Sama, Chijiro offered. Why use violence when words will suffice, Chijiro Kun? And Al, I doubt he holds a grudge for actions committed generations before he was ever born. He wasn't raised in Uzumaki so he wasn't taught to hate us I bet. If something does happen, Meisama, what would you have us do? Chijiro asked. Nothing, stay out of it. And until something does happen we will match the graciousness shown to us by our host. I was pacing across the room and that was never a good sign. His heavy footsteps adding a slight tremor to the ground. Now free of enemy eyes, the large cage was venting his anger with abandon. A little shit. He yelled as he clenched his fists. He killed Dodai, killed our ambush unit. Son of a whore. And now they plot. I guarantee they are planning to take us out. Isama, we don't know Dodai is dead. We don't know anything. Maybe he used the Hurishin to get here and left before the attack on Konoha ever started. You don't even believe that. I bellowed to his second in command. Darui merely adjusted in his seat. I wasn't wrong. He didn't believe that but it was also true they had no confirmation about anything. He was simply advising restraint. Rakage sama we're currently at a disadvantage and we have to assume the Kanoha contingent plans to act. Maybe we should slip out tonight and not give them the chance, she suggested. 
Run, I yelled. You expect me to run from them? Yes, run. Because this isn't about your ego, Darui cut in, losing his patience. You said you'd lead Kumo to greater heights, that we'd finally be free to be what we were always meant to be. Fine then but you have to be alive. Revenge will have to wait. You never understood, Darui. You're so used to the status quo you can't even see the effects. I'm done letting Konoha decide. I'm done tailoring my actions to them. Kumo is the strongest village. I am the strongest cage and when I say I will avenge my ninja I will do so. Tsunade, Orochimaru, Kakashi, and the brat die. It's just that simple. But you two will leave tonight along with our participants. Don't stop, don't look back. Dara quickly read over the note that was delivered to him by the panther cub. His facial expression remained passive betraying none of his thoughts. It wasn't good. He'd hoped this could be the start of something different, a break from the cycle of bloodletting that only justified more of the same. But I had attempted to attack Konoha, planned to assassinate Tsunade and company. That couldn't be overlooked, especially not by Konoha. Known as the peaceful village they still had to remind the other villages their cooperative streak had limits. Thank you, little one, Gara said as he scratched the summons under its chin gaining a purr in response. The courier dispelled and Gara turned to his siblings and explained the contents of the letter. Whatever is to happen won't happen here. Of that I am certain but it appears we must ready for war in earnest. Temeri and Kenkuro both frowned. War was such a heavy word and an experience none of the trio had, something that could not be said for the other major villages. Training and education can take one far but they knew there were limitations and this was not something you generally wanted to do while learning on the job. Shit, Kenkuro exclaimed. Is there a way out, a way to resolve this? Gara shook his head. Even if I were willing to deal, and there would be no reason for Tsunade to believe it nor ignore what he'd been planning. Unless he was willing to submit a significant form of restitution but it was highly unlikely. Dara would continue on, however. Maybe things wouldn't change tonight but it could be a step toward progress. We only have about an hour before dinner is to begin. If you would both oversee the final arrangements, I need to finalize my own. His siblings acquiesced and departed Gara's office. The hour quickly passed and the Gokage and their guards, plus Naruto, were seated at the large circular table as several servers and service whites brought out the first course of the Kaiseki. As the appetizers were sat and the wait staff exited, all waited as Gara shared some words. I appreciate you all for indulging my request and not immediately returning to your villages. For too long, the five great shinobi villages have been separated and mistrustful, only forging alliances to better fight our wars. I do not believe that can be solved over one meal but I hope it can, and you will allow it to be a start. The grudges of old limit us. With that being said, please enjoy. Murmurs of appreciation fill the room then the attendees begin their meals in earnest. Mei was surprised by the colorful array of small dishes arranged on her plate, having assumed the desert village wouldn't be so bountiful. More courses were brought out as polite conversation was had. This seemed to offend Ai as he decided during the Futamano course to speak for the first time. So, you want to cement our stagnation into an alliance, Kaiskij? Everyone took notice of his disrespect. If we are stagnating how could continuing to do as we've done solve it? Gara asked, choosing to ignore the slight. That's simple, we allow the strong to prove out and rule. Because strength is what determines our course. Not politics and backroom trade deals. Power, the ability to make one act against their own interests outside of their own volition. Everything else is just window dressing. Sounds like chaos, the weak constantly seeking to unseat the strong. How would that be an improvement, Rakage Sama? May asked. If you can't control your people you shouldn't lead your people. If you can't keep your village you shouldn't have it. In the warring clans era, we lost the weaker clans. And all the potential within them, not to mention all the talent untapped by non-clan ninja. Romanticizing the past doesn't help us progress, Tsunade said. Hyukuku. Besides, by that logic Konoha should be the only remaining hidden village. Would you have preferred us to have slaughtered all of Kumo? Orochimaru added and took delight in Ai's frown. You would have failed if you tried but what came of any of the wars we waged? Nothing. Nothing fundamentally changed because Konoha will only allow their vision of growth while stamping down anything that threatens it. You win wars because you fight to outlast your enemy, not actually defeat them. The sand name called off Minato when he had Iwa under his sandals. And what? You expect to do something similar with his bastard? I finished by staring at Naruto, a Naruto more interested in his soup than the ravings of a soon-to-be dead man. Can he even speak without permission? If you think he has what Minato had you're deluded. You're very loud. So he does speak. Tell me, boy, do you think you are your father's equal? I honestly don't see how that's a concern of someone who decidedly wasn't my father's equal. Nine may not equal ten but it's still greater than seven last I checked. 
Darui and she tensed when they saw the scowl on Ai's face. The man looked ready to attack. And in truth, he wanted to. I wanted to say damn the consequences and murder the arrogant brat. Kill each of them. Let them see how powerless they would be against his lightning armor and his speed. But now wasn't the time. He couldn't enjoy it here. It's interesting you say that as in a different world I could have been your father. How about that? Matter of fact, I'll sign a peace treaty right now if you call me Arusama. Come on, say it. Naruto took it as a sign of maturity that he hadn't murder I, Darui, and she is a matter of reflex. He considered it a mark of personal growth. Oh, he was furious that this man would call attention to the attempted kidnapping. That would have no doubt led to repeated bouts of sexual violation. To goad him was beyond anger-inducing. But he had his mission and it was not the time to act. However, I would have to be punished. Somewhat surprising you don't have a child of your own, a man of your age. I guess manners weren't the only thing Dot I failed to teach you. Maybe he can try again once you return to Kumo. I didn't know what angered him more, the boy having the balls to taunt him or the bored look the little bastard was giving him as he said it. I felt a hand on his shoulder just as his rage was nearing its zenith. He turned and saw Darui trying to silently communicate an obvious truth, it wasn't the time. But it would be, soon. He'd put the Yuzumaki through the ringer and show him what a true cage fought like. Then he'd end his life and the rest of them. Eventually, all of Kanoha. None of them were a match for B and him. Only the surety of his future victory stayed his hand. The boy would have won last night. His discourteousness aside, the rakage has a point. Shinobi alliance work when there is a mutual enemy, not when created to avoid one. The very idea that any of us would permanently join some kind of agreement that reduced our authority for some nebulous benefit in the future is absurd. I don't like war, I've seen more of it than any in this room but words are cheap. Our actions are what carry real value and if it must be war then it must. Getting too comfortable in an alliance is just asking to be taken advantage of eventually. If you lack honor you cannot see it in others, Onoki Dono, Tsunade said. Our actions only carry weight because of the death we cause, no more and no less. If you treat an agreement as just a maneuver then that's all it can be. The question is what do you want specifically, and how can war gain it? I want an end to Kanoha's continental hegemonic order, I said. Good luck with that, Tsunade said with a snort. Soon talks cooled down and returned to polite topics but the tension never fully left as all knew one wrong word could spark conflict. Fortunately, the dinner ended without incident and all returned to their rooms. Well, all but one as Kakashi was currently looking at a closed, locked and sealed door to what was to be his room for the night. It had been unyouthfully commandeered by Naruto and Orochimaru, neither making a secret of what was to transpire. Kakashi rubbed the back of his head and looked toward Tsunade who only rolled her eyes. Fine, brat, but don't get any ideas or you'll be introduced to a game I call Kakashi Ball. Got it, she said as she entered her room, Kakashi not far behind. Ma, ma, Tsunade-sama, I would never try anything untoward. Uh huh, you'll be taking the couch. I wouldn't have it any other way. As Tsunade and Kakashi were settling into their temporary arrangement, Orochi pushed her lover against the door as soon as she was sure their privacy was protected. Eagerly, she pulled him down into a kiss briefly realizing he'd grown a little. Her finger assaulted his clothing, she dispatching it with the same ruthless efficiency she would any other enemy that stood in her way. His armor, shirt, and mesh were quickly removed before he returned the favor or removing her kimono. A blink of an eye, or at least that's how long it felt before they were in the shower exchange long kisses and exploring each other's bodies. Until Naruto settled on her most sensitive area, going over it in slow, circular motions with his middle finger. Gradually the speed and pressure would increase until she was experienced her first climax of the night. Time went hazy again as she came down from her orgasm as they were now in bed. Naruto was content to pay further attention to the same area, this time utilizing his tongue as Orochi ran her fingers through his crimson locks. And again she was brought to climax, the events of the night decidedly not in her original plan as she was to be in control. But it was a wonderful derailment and she'd have allowed it to continue if not for the cocky grin adorning her lover's face. That simply wouldn't do. With ease, she reversed their positions and straddled the object of her obsession. She smiled when she heard a familiar moan. Not so smug now, Naruto-kun she thought as she watched his eyes shut tightly in response to her machinations. It was her turn to don a smirk as she rode Naruto, putting the durability of the bed to the test. Orochi kept her pace, even as Naruto sat up and pulled her toward his body, his breathing labored. They soon found their mutual release and shared a final kiss before parting. Lying on his chest, Orochi heard Naruto chuckle at seemingly nothing. She looked up, her yellow orbs expressing the unasked question. Naruto, looking down at her understood. I love you, you know, he said and laughed again when she went wide-eyed. 
I'm not saying it so you will or for any reason other than it's the truth and I want you to know, Titabeo, he assured her. Even with his reassurance, Orochi was thrown for a loop. She never thought of her relationships in terms of love. Sure, she'd do anything for Tsunade and Koharu as they would do the same for her and helped her when she was younger manage her impulses. Was that love? They'd never said it. Had they assumed she knew or that she wouldn't care? But even in comparison, she knew Naruto was different. The potential life growing in her womb was a testament to that. Was that love? She'd known for some time he'd be hers, that he was already interested only ease things along. He was to be hers in an exchange. She'd see to his happiness and the safety of what he valued. It was a perk of not fighting his fate. Yes, he made her happy. He challenged her to grow, to consider things in ways she'd never have before. Even Jiria's crappy belief in peace sounds more reasonable coming from Naruto. Yes, his smile often makes her feel funny and when hugs her from behind and lightly kisses her neck her pulse would quicken. Those were just biological responses. Sure, she could enjoy his company even if they were just quietly reading her feet propped up on his lap. And yes, she'd willingly subject her body to the trauma that is pregnancy to give him a child. But that was only because she was high. Orochi's thought process halted. Did she really see herself that way? She'd need to talk to Tsunade. She was sappy and would know. Besides, it was time to share the good news. Naruto-kun, can you enter sage mode? She requested. He nodded, having given her time to sort out her thoughts and not taking her silence personally at all. As if he were born to it, Naruto allowed the surrounding natural energy to enter his chakra system, instantly balancing it with his own source of power. For one who has never experienced sage mode, it was almost indescribable. The sensation of being connected to and aware of life, its beauty, its flaws and all the complexities therein. And it happened so fast, the serene mindset allowed a sage to not be overwhelmed by the onslaught of new information. Taking a deep breath, Naruto narrowed his focus to his immediate surroundings, to Orochi and himself, and a partial presence, not fully life, slighter, like Kirinai-sensei when he remotely checks on her but even fainter. Naruto was now the one to go wide-eyed as his toad-like eyes stared into Orochi's slitted pupils. She nodded at his unasked question and found herself in a tight embrace, though not enough to cause any pain, with her maelstrom thanking her. How far are you along? Is this why Oba-chan didn't want you to come with me to face I? When can we know the sex? Kyukuku, calm down, Naruto-kun, she said, not having seen him this excited since before his training trip. Eight weeks, yes, another eight to twelve weeks. This is so awesome. I can't wait to tell Shika, Shino, and Kurenai-sensei. Although, can we wait until after she has her baby? I don't want to steal her thunder, Titebeo. Of course, Naruto-kun. She's due soon so it's no problem to wait. You know, you're really throwing my grand seduction plan out of whack, Orochi-chan. I thought it was a plan to woo me, she said with a teasing grin. Naruto shared it before it dropped. Shit, he said. I isn't in the village. Damn it, I have to run them down, he said as he got out of bed. He channeled chakra to his right hand and placed it over his left peck. A seal activated and he was fully dressed and armed. Naruto quickly activated another seal on his left wrist as he approached Orochi, kissing her deeply and placing an object in her hand. Think about it and give me your answer later, he said as he dashed out the window, his sage mode buttressing his already impressive speed. Orochi opened her hand and found a black ring box. Once he was out of the village, Naruto performed an impressively long shunshin, and another and another, until he was standing in front of the two large chakra signatures he'd sensed. He knew the two, they were well known as Kumo's guardians, Karabi and Yujido Nai. Naruto was surprised, not to see them, that was whatever, no it was something else entirely. I'm not surprised your rakage is a coward but I am a little shocked he'd let the other cage know it, Naruto said. Karabi snickered while Yujito sneered. He didn't much care how they felt about it. Naruto made a wood clone to deal with them. Wait oh, Mr. Nine Minus Zero. Didn't come for a test of might, let's avoid a pointless fight, fool ya fool. You really do rap when you talk. Honestly thought Jiria was being a little racist on that one. And sure, you two stand down and we don't have to fight. Do you really think we'll let you run down Aisama so you can try to kill him? Yujito yelled at the Yuzumaki. She promptly found herself unable to breathe, move, or even think as Naruto applied a great deal of pressure on her. I think that anything you do is a meaningless gesture and I don't have time to teach babies how to breathe in my presence. You're outclassed, girl. Don't make a jerk of yourself. A deal I'm proposing based on the brotherhood of the chosen. I is a hothead but I can't let him wind up dead. Take us in his place and that'll change his pace. That's a stopgap measure. He'll simply bide his time until he can attack us to free the both of you or he'll kidnap someone of high value to Konoha to force a trade. 
He won't be reasoned with so he doesn't get reasoned with. He gets me and that has one outcome. If I betrays I off myself without delay. Or it is bond. Naruto looked at his fellow container while thinking. Hirama would have alerted him if he were lying so he wasn't. True, he could run down I, the wood clone could stall these two. However, this might be the only way to avoid war. It was a low percentage play but maybe it was the kind of foolish bet this world needed. He needed to know why Karabi was going this far. Why put yourself in a jackpot for I? He caused this and he should suffer the consequence. Family, 9 minus 0. Shit, Naruto thought. If you'd pulled that shit an hour ago we'd be brawling right now, Naruto said before his clone and he blurred in front of Yujito and B respectively. Each placed an assorted ceiling array on them. One was a Horatian Shiki and the other a bomb. He explained the latter to them and made sure they understood what would happen if they stepped out of line. Karabi understood his compliance was the only thing keeping his brother alive as Juki relayed something about 9-0 felt very familiar and very dangerous to him. Let's go back to Suna. I hope Obachan doesn't kick my ass, Naruto said and the trio of containers made their way back to the nearest Shinobi village. So this was it for today. I will continue this series in next part. Till then, we weave offline.